Good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from in the world. Um, a big welcome to our workshop today on the implementation of novel laboratory diagnostics for emerging infectious diseases. This webinar is brought to you by several different uh, organisations, so I haven't really got time to go into detail for all of them, but just uh, the titles are Pandora ID Net, Cantam, Alert, Few Crews, Ready and the Global Health Network. Um, and today our topic is going to be covering two main um, areas, so rapid development of reliable diagnostics for emerging infectious diseases. And we're really excited to have five speakers and I'm going to introduce those guys to you um, when we get to the talks and then we'll have a break and then we'll have setting up mobile lab advantages and challenges. Um, I'm your chair for today's session so we obviously the workshop is split over two days and we have a tomorrow's session as well. My name is Isabel Honeybourne and I work at University College London in the UK and I'm the project manager for Pandora. Okay, so this is an overview of our programme for today. Um, so I would like to uh, firstly um, welcome uh, Francine, Professor Francine Atumi, who's at FRCM and um, Public of Congo. And Francine heads up um, Pandora and Cantam, who are two of the networks um, involved in bringing you this workshop today. We've got a recorded uh, session um, of welcome from Francine because the internet's not always very stable from um, ROC. Um, Francine is um, heads up FRCM and also um, has a heavy uh, involvement with the University of Tübingen in Germany. Um, she's very committed to women in science in Africa leadership, and um, I will hand over to uh, the recorded uh, welcome from Francine. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, wherever you are. I am Francine Tumi, the coordinator of Pandora Network and also the coordinator of Contacts for Central Africa Clinical Research Network. And I'm very pleased to welcome you today to this important workshop organized jointly by Pandora and by the Global Health Network. This two-day workshop is very important because you will be uh, trained, you will be informed about novel di uh, diagnostic tools important for the diagnostic of emerging infectious diseases like COVID-19, but as we know, there are so many other uh, emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases. So this workshop will be uh, facilitated by experts and at the end you will get certificate of attendance. I'm also sure that this uh, meeting uh, will be a great opportunity to strengthen our collaboration. So I wish you a very fruitful meeting. Thank you for that, uh, Francine. Um, so that's uh, welcome to everybody. So I think we will start with our first session. We have got five speakers and uh, hopefully they're gonna keep to time. So um, we've got three 30 minute talks. I'd like to introduce the first uh, two speakers. Um, so thank you for agreeing to uh, speak at the workshop. So Marta Suarez from FIND. Uh, Marta joined FIND in 2017 as a product development consultant. And her current role is responsible for overall strategic direction and management of the technical and scientific programs within FIND. Um, she has lots of experience both in academia and industry, and we're very excited to have her to sh here today to share her knowledge with us. Uh, I'd also like to introduce Davy Emperador. Um, I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing your names correctly, by the way. Uh, I'll do my very best. Um, Davy is a scientific officer in the pandemic preparedness at FINE, supporting diagnostic development for outbreak and epidemic prone diseases for low and middle income countries. She also has extensive um, experience in the field and will share that experience with us today. So I'd like to hand over to Martin and Davey now, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Isabella, and thank you to the organizers, everybody at the 
Global Health Network and Pandora for inviting us to be here. It's an honor. And thank you to all of the um, works of participants for listening in. Uh, we're going to start by first giving you just a, a couple of um, couple of introductory slides on what FINE is and our role in the ACT Accelerator. And then I'll pass it over to Debbie to our outbreak um, prone and diseases expert at FIND. Next slide, please. Next. Um, so FINE is, is the Global Alliance for Diagnostics and our mission is to ensure that there is equitable access to reliable diagnosis around the world. Uh, we were founded in 2003, initially as a product development and delivery partnership. And our role has really grown beyond that of just product development to, to become a glue for all of the stakeholders that are involved in both development of the diagnostics, but also access to those diagnostics. So we connect countries and communities to understand their needs. We connect funders and that are able to support those needs, the decision makers, the healthcare providers, as well as the developers, with the goal to spur, spur innovation in diagnostics development and to make in testing an integral part of a sustainable and resilient health systems. We are a WHO collaborating center for laboratory strengthening and diagnostic technology evaluation. And we're also a member of the CHIBD by WHO. One of our core competencies is to, to support clinical trials to generate evidence for performance of the tests. Um, and to that end, we are ISO certified so we can contribute the data for regulatory submissions of the tests. Um, most recently, we've become a co-convener of the Access to COVID Tools Accelerator, also called ACT-A, which was a, an organization founded, a, a really an agenda-driven platform um, uh, launched last April by WHO and several governments. And I can give you a little bit um, more deep dive on that in the next slide. Um, we recently just, recently just launched our 2021 strategy uh, as recent as yesterday. And as part of our new strategy, we expect to be able to impact 1 million of lives and really save $1 billion in healthcare costs to the patients and the healthcare systems and working with several countries around the world. Next, please. Um, so the Access to COVID Tool Accelerator, as I said, um, is an initiative and a facilitating group um, that was launched last April uh, at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic to really mobilize resources, oversee and report progress um, on our advancement uh, to contain the COVID-19 pandemic uh, worldwide. The, the ACT Accelerator has three pillars, one on vaccines, one on therapeutics, and one in diagnostics. And FINE, together with the Global Fund, are the co-conveners of the diagnostic pillars. Um, WHO is also obviously part of this uh, uh, pillar and leading on the product allocation. I think uh, for now, I'm going to pass it on to Debbie, who is going to explain to you more about um, our work on outbreak, outbreak from diseases. Thanks, Marta, and nice to meet everyone. Uh, great to be a part of this, this session and workshop. Um, so I'll go quickly through um, you know, uh, the, the challenges for outbreak prone diseases and then what we've learned so far um, you know, with our experience now for all of us on COVID-19. Um, so here on the right side, you'll see a table, and apologies, it's fairly small, but um, uh, you can see this table um, in the source down below. Um, but the table really highlights uh, the different diagnostic needs for select WHO RND blueprint pathogens. And if you just look at, at the colors, basically, you'll see that for many of these pathogens, there is, um, there, there is still a, a massive gap in the diagnostics available to be able to detect the pathogens, especially in endemic regions. Um, and, you know, except for and it should actually say four instead of three pathogens, except for the, the pathogens that have had recent high profile outbreaks like Ebola, um, the initial SARS-CoV, uh, Zika, and now COVID-19, um, you know, gaps still remain. Um, and for the three with the high profile outbreaks, um, this international focus and funding led has helped really prioritize the development of validated diagnostics much, much faster, much quick, more quickly than other diseases. And, and 
um, I think for shared challenges for all outbreak diseases. And I think for the for the folks here in the in the meeting, I think we all are, understand there's challenges in um, the limited availability of a reference test for these specific diseases, um, limited commercially available tests for rapid deployment um, in the countries and in endemic regions. Um, the need for validated tests, so there might be tests available but not have gone through full validation so that we're, we're uh, clear of the quality of the test. And then um, you know, I think something that will be discussed later on is the need for capacity strengthening for laboratories to do the testing in country. And um, you know, as I said before, I think for COVID, particularly COVID has really placed diagnostics um, in the spotlight. And so while those gaps that outbreak diagnostics have been overlooked for years, um, COVID-19 has shown what the world could do um, and how quickly we could get tests, tests available and how quickly we can um, you know, put testing into, into national and international discourse. I think it's pretty amazing that you have all of these um, you know, political leaders and, and, and local leaders who know what a PCR test is now. So it speaks highly to all of the lab testing um, that, that the folks I think here who are participating have been doing. Um, so slide, this slide here um, is a matrix of tests for multiple use cases uh, to respond to the pandemic. So this is not just for SARS-CoV-2, although it's specific to SARS-CoV-2, this is something to think about uh, for other outbreak prone diseases and could easily be adapted depending on you know, the virus, um, the epidemiology, et cetera. And so as we go down, um, if you look to the left side, the far left side, as we go down the healthcare testing provider level, you'll see that the different types of tests will differ for the different use cases, which are clinical diagnosis, looking at um, vaccine or, or treatment efficacy, zero prevalence and surveillance. Um, but then if you look at the right, depending on uh, where the testing occurs, um, you, you have to uh, compromise with, with performance. Um, but however, it's important to have a broad portfolio um, to effectively respond to an outbreak or epidemic. And um, I, I'll go through more, more in depth um, of the different uh, specific diagnostics that, that are mentioned here. And so here um, is really an example of the speed at which we can have new diagnostics for emerging or outbreak uh, prone diseases. And this is what we see now. Um, with the availability of COVID-19 antigen RDTs. Um, so I think, uh, I, I won't go through all of this, it's a busy slide, but the, the main takeaway here is that in less than a year, um, you know, by September, 2020, we, we have the first WHO EUL um, or emergency use listed antigen RDT available for, for testing for SARS-CoV-2. Um, uh, if you look below for the malaria RDT timeline, you know, the development of a, of a, a good malaria test has taken multiple years and almost a few decades. Um, and if we compare it to another outbreak disease like Ebola, I think for Ebola, the availability of um, a rapid test uh, took about one year. Um, and so this is fairly unprecedented for a novel virus, um, especially in the development of antigen tests. Um, given that antigen tests too, do take a few months um, to be available because of the need um, to develop specific antibodies to that target antigen. Um, and, you know, go, stepping back as well, not just for antigen tests, but um, the timelines for the development of tests of different types of tests for COVID-19 was incredibly fast. Um, here for PCR tests, uh, we had the sequences available early 2020 and by the next month or so, there were lab developed tests and lab protocols available um, that countries and laboratories can use uh, to start detecting um, SARS-CoV-2. Um, and then all, similarly by then the first um, in vitro diagnostic test, so commercially available test uh, was available. And then similarly for the antibody test and point of care molecular tests, you know, within a few months of the new outbreak, we've seen a plethora um, and an exponential growth of available tests uh, to be able to detect SARS-CoV-2. And so now we'll walk through some specific test types that are available for detecting um, SARS-CoV-2 and for detecting COVID-19. And um, so here there are three main categories of molecular tests for SARS-CoV-2. 
um, for molecular tests, most, if not all, are performed in laboratories and rely on specific sample collection, transport, uh, results uh, showing systems um, to ensure um, access to testing, especially in more decentralized areas. And um, so the three main um, this is the three main categories that I'm sure everyone is familiar with. You have lab developed tests, you have open manual kits and closed proprietary tests and platforms. Um, for lab developed tests and open manual kits, they have similar test formats. Um, I think one, one thing to highlight is for the lab developed tests, they're more often the first tests available during a new outbreak or any outbreak, um, given the availability of laboratories who are able to create you know, specific primers and probes and the availability of, of these reagents in the laboratories. And so examples of those are the Charité protocol and the CDC protocol that was immediately available uh, once the sequences for SARS-CoV-2 um, were shared. And um, some pros of the lab developed tests, they're usually the fastest to develop um, and they're not reliant on any particular test supplier. So someone can, um, or a laboratory can easily make these tests um, as quickly and as needed as possible. Um, the, um, the, the challenge and the cons for it is it does require separate nucleic acid extraction, so biosafety is an issue. And then they're more prone to variability, um, given that it could be developed in one laboratory, but it may not perform or more validation is needed should they be needed and used in separate labs. Um, the main difference for the open manual kits and the closed proprietary tests and platforms is that these are mostly commercially available. Um, and so um, the, the, the main pro is that because they're commercially available, there's a strict and set um, QC, QA program to ensure that the kits perform um, adequately every time that they are being used. And for, I think for open manual kits, um, again, the cons are very similar to, to the lab developed test where it does require a separate nucleic acid extraction and it requires well-trained staff um, to be able to conduct the testing. And then for closed proprietary tests, um, and an example of that is down here with the gene experts, um, your Abbott ID now platforms in the mobile is, um, you know, they're, they're, because of the more automated approach, it's much easier to use. Um, and there are built-in QCs, so you are more confident in the quality of the results, um, but it does require the procurement of new machines. Um, and so if there's not a set install base already available in the laboratory, it does take some time to set up. Um, and so other, you know, other tests available um, for SARS-CoV-2 and for other diseases as well, you have your antigen and antibody-based tests. Um, so I think most of us know uh, the main difference between, but again, how it works for antigen tests, you detect the presence of the virus versus antibody tests as you detect the presence of the immune response to that virus or, or pathogen, I should say. Um, and I think the, the key differences, particularly for SARS-CoV-2 um, to highlight are sample types. Um, so for antibody tests, I think all of us are, are fairly used to, to thinking of antibody tests. You're collecting blood, you're either using it in an ELISA or you're putting it in RDT. Um, but for the antigen test specifically, you are using your nasopharyngeal nasal or your, your swabs or oral fluid. Um, and so the, I think that, that this have something to be said of how to train and how to use the antigen test for SARS-CoV-2 specifically. Um, and then for both these types of tests, there are two or there are main formats. So you have those that are lab-based like your ELISAs and your automated immunoassay platforms. And for these, they could either be lab developed or commercially available. And then lastly, for more decentralized testings, we have um, rapid diagnostic tests um, that uh, Marta will speak more on, specifically on SARS-CoV-2 later on in the talk. And then lastly, in, in terms of um, you know, testing types and, and testing platforms, we have sequencing, which has really um, become an important tool to support disease surveillance for SARS-CoV-2. And I think for other emerging and re-emerging diseases. And so here is a quick um, view of the epidemiology of the SARS-CoV-2 variants of concerns. Um, you have the B1617 lineage um, that's been um, in, in, high, in high transmission, particularly in India, and then the other, the other um, variants of concern here. 
And um, because of you know the, the the growing concern for the vir for VOCs and other VOIs, um, these recent guidelines from WHO on genomic surveillance have highlighted you know key priority areas for SARS-CoV-2 that I think are um, going to be useful and needed for other emerging or re-emerging diseases to come. So that includes um, having a program framework available for sequencing in countries, um, having the capacity in country to be able to do the sequencing. So not only the wet lab, but also the bioinformatics, um, the need for R&D and technology assessments to, to identify new um, next-gen sequencing workflows, especially for use and ad adoption in low and middle-income countries. And then you have, your, you have the need for advocacy and education to raise awareness for sequencing, not only in the public, but also for laboratorians and also for, for policymakers as well, and other scientists, and then bioinformatics and data sharing, how um, countries, especially um, you know, laboratories in low and middle-income countries can participate um, in data sharing. And then lastly, for the for the sequencing, um, particularly, you know, the, the it's um, trying to think of how to say this, but it also includes um, not only assessing the epi of the disease, but the impact of uh, these new mutations on available tests. And it's something the laboratories um, and laboratorians will need to think about. So here we highlight the specific gene mutations from two. Um, variants of concerns within the SARS-CoV-2 genome, and then the tests that we know of and the specific targets that could be affected by these new, um, by, or by these new mutations and, and new variants of concern. And so I think that the key point here is, um, you know, as, as laboratorians, there will be the need for continuous assessment of available tests and their ability to properly detect um, SARS-CoV-2 and potentially other um, epidemic pathogens, and that this will need to be an ongoing activity as you're thinking about um, tests that are going to be used in the laboratory, tests you're developing, and tests you're rolling out. And so I hand it back to, to Marta. Thank you so much, Debbie. Um, so for the next couple of sections here, we, we wanted to highlight um, when we are specifically in, in emergency situations, and I know there is going to be a panel later on verification and validation and all of the different steps that tests need to go through before they can achieve regulatory authorization or approval. Um, in specifically in emergency situations, other outbreaks like Ebola and Zika made it very clear that tests come to market very quickly, as we've seen, and David has highlighted the timelines, but also the need for independent evaluations, the need to verify that the quality of the products that are getting to market um, is, a, is meeting standards and is able to, to enable uh, quality diagnosis. So very early in the pandemic, uh, FINE decided that one of our critical roles in the, in the COVID-19 pandemic was to conduct these independent evaluations like we saw in other outbreaks. Um, next, please, Debbie. Um, so we've been conducting independent evaluations of tests since really March, April, as soon as we were able to set up a network of laboratories. And here in this slide, you can see the map of the network of labs that, um, with which we are partnering to conduct these evaluations. We've conducted evaluations for molecular tests initially. And you know, as Debbie was mentioning, generally the, the molecular test, um, even beyond lab, uh, laboratory developed tests, even for those that are IVDs are the first ones that are being developed. We then also conducted evaluations for antibody tests as they were being developed. And then more recently, we've been focusing on the antigen rapid tests. Again, the purpose of these um, studies is to do comparisons of performance in an independent setting. Um, as you know, when a manufacturer develops a product, they go through this verification and validation and they generate their own data. Um, however, in, in emergency situations, the requirements from regulatory agencies for the data generated by the manufacturers are usually uh, smaller, the requirements, than when you are in, in, a situ in a normal situation. Therefore, there is a need to really generate more data and generate evidence to show that the product is um, performing to standards. Next, Debbie. 
Um, so this is just, I'm just gonna highlight um, a few of the tests that we've been uh, developing. And if you, if you go to our website and the link is here, you can see the reports, all of the reports from the independent evaluations that find conducts for all of the tests are publicly available in our website. You have the link there. This is just an example of a few of them. Uh, our evaluations are laboratory based, so they are not operational. They are performance based and we're looking at verifying the analytical sensitivity of the test as well as determine the clinical performance. Uh, the study design varies per test, as you can see here for molecular tests and then later for the antibody test. Uh, we conducted retrospective studies using remnant clinical samples. And the reason to do this is because we can go a lot faster and test a larger number of tests. And as obviously, as you all know, speed is, is important in an emergency situation. Uh, we conducted the molecular test evaluations from February to August last year, and we conducted a total of, we evaluated a total of 24 tests. And again, all of the reports are in our, in our website. Next, please. Same for antibody tests. The, the goal for these evaluations was to determine the clinical performance of these tests. And they were also retrospective studies using remnant samples. We, have, we evaluated a total of 35 rapid tests for antibody detection and 16 ELISAs. And those studies were conducted in the second half of last year and we finished earlier this year. And yeah, sorry, just to highlight in the previous slide um, that if you go to our website, you will see different ways of, of visualizing the data that we obtained in those comparison studies. Thanks, Amy. Next, please. Um, so just to, to finish on the independent evaluations, we also conducted, and we're still conducting independent evaluations for rapid antigen tests. This is work that is still ongoing. Um, we have nine sites across uh, several continents conducting these studies. The antigen rapid test studies are a little bit more complex because these are prospective studies um, where we are collecting the nasopharyngeal or nasal swabs for the most part uh, to evaluate the both analytical, uh, the, the clinical performance of the tests. And the reason for the need on prospective studies is that many of the tests that are being evaluated have their own proprietary uh, reagents to process a sample. And therefore we cannot just use remnants that may have been pre-processed. So this makes these studies a little bit more complex and it's slower to move forward. And as you can imagine, as the positivity rate uh, changes geographically, so so do our studies. So we need to, to switch from some sites to others um, to conduct this. We're also conducting analytical performance that can, we can obtain results faster. Um, and that has been relatively helpful, but there is also, and I'm sure you are aware just from the literature, um, there is not a one-to-one -one correspondence between the analytical performance um, and the clinical performance, especially because there is not uh, homogeneity on the materials that are used for analytical performance. And this actually highlights one of the things that I'm gonna to mention towards the end in terms of what is one of the research gaps that are missing on, on these evaluations, which is the need for standards. So we can really standardize uh, the analytical uh, performance evaluations. Thanks, Amy, next. Um, so I think just to finish, uh, our part in this panel, we wanted to just highlight the success story for the antigen rapid test for, for the COVID-19 pandemic. And this is work that has been conducted by many stakeholders and many organizations within the ACT Accelerator and beyond ACT A um, over the last 18 months. Next, please. So just to, to reemphasize what Debbie was mentioning before, um, in order to contain a, an outbreak, a pandemic in this case, um, we need a portfolio of tools. Um, and we see, the, we see the role of the antigen rapid test to be used for, for really early detection and patient management uh, as a complement to molecular tests and PCR. They, at a high level, I think we can all agree that there is a trade-off between the performance and the access. Antigen rapid tests have a much rapid turnaround time under 30 minutes, many of them are under 15 minutes. They can be administered in decentralized settings outside of laboratories, and they can be performed by even in some cases, lay workers with train, uh, with some training. And they can be scaled 
further with appropriate funding and they are more, more affordable. Now, on the trade-off, their accuracy is lower than, per, uh, than molecular tests. So again, we need this portfolio of tests to adequately contain an outbreak. Next, please. Um, so acknowledging this need for complementing the initially laboratory-based molecular tests with a decentralized tool, WHO issue at first target product profile in July. Um, and you can see here in the table in the left what the, some of the key product requirements that are highlighted in that target product profile. Um, I, should, I, I would like to highlight that, you know, things move so quickly that in the initial requirements, and I just to highlight, for example, in clinical sensitivity, in the initial TPP that was, um, published for public consultation in July last year, the requirements for sensitivity were 70% for acceptable and 80% clinical sensitivity for desirable, because back then, and this was just the very first few antigen rapid tests were coming up, and it looked like the sensitivity was not going to be that great. And also, that was also based on our experience with the flu rapid tests, which are not very well performing. However, as you know, a few months passed and we started seeing results from the manufacturers, we saw that actually rapid antigen tests can achieve a higher clinical sensitivity. So the numbers you can see there were updated in the revised TPPs in September. Um, the purpose of the antigen rapid test as, you know, as delineated in the policy and the guidelines for use um, by WHO are to be used on suspected COVID-19 cases and their close contacts to diagnose um, SARS-CoV-2 infection in areas where the molecular testing is either not available or the turnaround times are so long that they obviate the clinical utility. Next, please. So if we just fast forward a few months, uh, not that long, and, and these numbers are for, for today, uh, we now have uh, 359 antigen rapid tests, either in development or through regulatory authorization which is really remarkable. And you know, as Debbie was saying, it, not only the timelines were compressed, but there is such a huge interest that we have a really large number of manufacturers developing these tests. Of those 359, 267 are regulatory authorized, and three of them um, are listed by WHO under the emergency use listing program. And these are just the, on the right, you can see on the table, the clinical performance for the tests, for the three tests that are EUL, um, and this is just a, a summary version of the reports that are on our website. These are results from the independent evaluation that uh, FINE has conducted. So as we can see, we now have many tests and the high quality ones are actually meeting TPP, um, which is again remarkable for a program that has only been ongoing for 18 months. Next, please. Um, just to highlight that, you know, countries some countries have been faster than others uh, in uptaking the, the antigen rapid test. But as I was saying, uh, as a complementary tool, many of these countries have developed algorithms where antigen rapid tests are a tool to contain the outbreak, a tool to diagnose these contacts with, with PCR being uh, serving as confirmatory um, when needed. So in, in this particular algorithm, which is shared by many ministries of health, um, the antigen rapid test is run first on a nasophoregial or nasal samples, depending on what the, the test is developed for. If a result is positive, then that is considered a confirmed uh, COVID-19 infection, and it's proceeded as per the protocols developed by the uh, Ministry of Health. I think this is a, something that I want to highlight. It's pretty remarkable. You know, when we started working on antigen rapid tests, we did not know if the specificity of this test would be high enough. To, to take a positive result and just treat it as positive uh, without confirmation. You know, we now see that many of the high quality tests are shown specificities that are higher than 99%. Um, on the right side of the diagnostic algorithm, if you get a negative result and the patient has no symptoms, then the, it, it is generally reported as negative, but if the patient has symptoms, then that's when it's re, uh, recommended. To, to request an RT-PCR for confirmation. So just to highlight, this is one algorithm. There are others um, in some uh, countries to, for a positive result, to confirm a positive result, there are 
algorithms that are being explored to do serial testing with a second antigen rapid test to rule out uh, even further the false positives. But again, I think what we what we're trying to highlight here is that by having this portfolio of tests, we can come up with testing algorithms that are cost effective um, and that can shorten the timelines from identifying a, a potential case to, to diagnosis, which ultimately translates in a better containment of the pandemic and lowering the health care costs. Next, please. Um, so this is just to highlight some of the work that uh, really the amazing collaboration between many organizations within the ACT Accelerator to bring antigen rapid tests forward. You know, as I, as I highlighted first, you know, on the, on the top left, you can see WHO very quickly um, stepped up to create guidance on the use of uh, rapid tests. Uh, the PQ team, the, the, procure, um, the product qualification team at WHO uh, is working on evaluating EUL, emergency use listing submissions. And there are, as I, as I said, there are three that have been uh, uh, listed right now. Several organizations like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and, um, and the Global Fund created a volume guarantee that was negotiated by CHAI for 120 million tests for LMIC for six months for the first two EUL products, which were the Avon and the SD Biosensor. And then other organizations like FINE and Unitate will work to really catalyze the country uptake and to support further R&D to, to improve the tests. So just in the next slide, I'll talk to you a little bit about that effort. And I'm going to go very quickly because I'm conscious that we are running low in time. Debbie, please. Um, so FINE and Unitate last year in July, we launched a, an expression of interest called to explore um, to really foster um, better uh, antigen rapid tests and also to accelerate their access to low and middle income countries. And in addition, one of the goals of our, of our expression of interest was to foster decentralization, decentralization of the manufacturing capacity. And it was key to us because as you are all very well aware, uh, in a pandemic situation, and it was critical last year, especially during quarter two and quarter three, um, supply chains are hugely disrupted and many manufacturers were not able to either import raw materials or to export the final test uh, to the countries that needed them. So COVID-19 really um, emphasized something that it was very clear to find for years, which is to meet the needs of LMICs, we need to decentralize manufacturing and innovation and increase uh, manufacturing capacity and, and capac um, build capacity in the countries. Next, David, please. I'm going to go very quickly through these. You know, the, the expression of interest was very well received. We received more than 100 applications. And over the course of a couple of months, we brought it down to four finalists um, for contract signature. Next, please. Ultimately, uh, we were able to, to sign two agreements that in the short term were able to bring the price down um, for the test to two and a half dollars, which is below the $5 that the, the products, uh, the antigen rapid tests were being negotiated at the time. Prices have gone down significantly since then. So this is more for uh, early Q1. Uh, so the contracts were really to expand manufacturing capacity to uh, fund R&D so that uh, these uh, particular companies were able to increase their ability to supply um, tests to low and middle income countries. Fine and Unitate's agreement are not volume guarantees. We do not procure products. We invest in the companies to improve their ability to supply low and middle income countries. And then in the right, you can see that we also, we're also executing two different contracts uh, with a Brazilian manufacturer and a West African manufacturer to support the technology transfer of well-performing tests uh, for regional manufacturing. Next, please. And this is just a graphic to, to highlight the decrease in the price, which has been really a combination of uh, the work of many organizations, you know, finance units, R&D investments, but also the market shaping interventions by many of the um, ACT Accelerator players, um, as well as the work that ACT Accelerator partners and others beyond ACT are doing to generate evidence to support uh, policy guidance and to support the rapid uptake of the tests. Next, please. 
Um, just to finish with, there's been a lot that has been done over the last 18 months, but there is a still research gaps. Um, I don't have time to go through these ones, but uh, this will be available on the website later. So I think that's uh, it for today. Thank you very much, everybody. And we'll be happy to take questions uh, during the Q&A session later. Thank you so much, Marta and Davey, for a really interesting overview. And uh, SARS-CoV-2 is really a good case study for um, what we're discussing today. And I think that, that's going to generate some good discussion in the Q&A. And as Marta said, please, can you post your questions now before they go out of your head? And then we'll come back to those in the Q&A sec uh, section. Okay, thanks again. And now we're going to move on to a talk from um, Alisi Versiani. Um, and Alisi uh, graduated in veterinary medicine. Um, and interesting to get a different perspective because often we have all um, medical uh, graduates, um, but nice to get somebody from the veterinary field. Um, Alisi also has experience in uh, microbiology and virology, uh, mainly molecular biology, um, and she's got a very big interest in nano biomedicine. So I will hand over to Alisi now, who will be able to uh, introduce herself much better than I can, and to talk about um, perhaps her um, organisation, FAMERP, which I'm not, a, I don't know much about. So I'd be interested to hear about that, Alisi. Thank you very much. Hi everyone. Uh, thank you, Isabel. As Isabel just said, um, I'm from Brazil, actually. Uh, Alice Vestiani, nice to meet you. It's an honor uh, to be here with you today. Um, actually, I'm from uh, the School of Medicine of uh, São José do Rio Preto in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And this presentation will be more a research, researcher uh, um, uh, presentation for what we developed at uh, the lab and how can we uh, do a technology transfer for the market or even uh, if this will be uh, uh, um, interesting for some networking with different uh, interdisciplinary uh, uh, labs. So uh, this talk I will, um, I will talk about um, the estate development pathway actually uh, some definitions, some criteria that we need to uh, understand before uh, think about to start our experimentation, how we need to deal with uh, controls and samples, validations, types of uh, diagnostic and so on. And of course, I will present to you some of our data experience with uh, diagnostic development. Uh, I will I talk a little bit about non-technology that is my uh, expertise, uh, but also how we deal with classical methodologies and uh, new types of biomolecules or selection of biomolecules for uh, diagnostic tools and also new methodology with some old fashioned uh, uh, biomolecules that we already use in uh, classical diagnostic assays and some of uh, our technologies improvements that we are doing uh, inside the lab. And after that, how we deal with uh, emerging or re-emerging re pathogens and uh, scientific network. So uh, first of all, when we think about uh, the development of assays, we need to uh, deal with uh, some criteria, <laughs> sorry, some criteria and what we think about uh, uh, what will be our main goals with this essay. So first, we need to establish if this essay will be a quantitative or a qualitative essay. It's important to understand uh, the disease and how this affects uh, the, the diagnostic result if we just need a yes or no answer or if we need a viral uh, um, load or some antibodies with uh, 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 measurements to uh, deal with uh, the disease outcome and how to manage uh, patients. So it's quite important 
to understand uh, uh, for what you are using your uh, diagnostic tool. Um, after that, it's so important to understand uh, your biological sample. Usually, as Isabel just said, uh, we think uh, most uh, on the human aspect of the diagnostic. So for human disease and what we think about uh, the clinical aspects and how to use this diagnostic tool, but it's just uh, um, at the same amount important to think about some uh, diagnostic development for food contamination and water resource and uh, even some of, of our uh, far animal, farm animals. Uh, so this is so important to understand if you are doing this uh, uh, um, assay for an um, individual sample or bullet sample. Uh, you need to understand your matrix composition, uh, such as urine or feces or whole blood that is quite different from serum or plasma that we are more used to uh, uh, use. And of course, we need to think uh, about the host or the organism interaction that could affect uh, your, your assay, such as uh, immune responses, uh, previous antibodies, or uh, some aspects of um, the, the individual uh, um, that could affect uh, your essay, um, especially at the readout. Uh, after that, we need to think about uh, the essay system. If you're using a physical, chemical, or biological based uh, essay, and of course, uh, we also need to uh, take account of the operator-related factors uh, that could affect, like. Uh, if you are developing an essay that is automatic, you don't have like this issue. But if your essay uh, needs to have a lot of steps for preparation, single preparation, or even on the running of this test, we need to consider contamination, uh, uh, bubbles, everything that could uh, uh, put be uh, like a troubleshooting for your essay and the capacity of this essay to perform. So those are really important things that we need to, to understand before the development. Uh, and it, uh, of course, we need to think about the result interpretation uh, because all of this depends on how you are uh, uh, establishing your essay if you uh, Pursuing an essay for a naked eye readout, you need to understand that we have like some issues between subjects uh, and, and the person that are, are running the test. So all of these should be considered as a troubleshooting for your essay. And uh, of course, we, we need to understand uh, a lot of how to establish your controls. So selection, collection, preparation, and preservation of samples are critical steps for the development of an essay and should be uh, considered uh, before you start uh, your development, during the optimization steps, and of course during the validation of these uh, criteria as Martha just uh, presented to us. So how to choose samples, this is uh, one of the most difficult things before even to establish your protocol. Uh, we need to uh, first realize if this uh, disease or if this pathogen has a reference method as a gold standard assay that you can uh, uh, pre-validate your controls, your samples, uh, and then call it this as true positives or true negative samples is uh, something quite important because uh, if you don't do this, uh, you could have like uh, things like this, that we have reference samples like a positive and a presumed negative. Uh, and this could affect uh, your, 
your diagnostic uh, uh, performance, especially in this uh, disease as SARS-CoV-2 that we have asymptomatic patients. Uh, of course, when we need about, if we think about controls, we also need to think about open sterile banks. Uh, this is also important to establish uh, some parameters for your sample. Uh, if these, you are collecting the sample from patients uh, with uh, more than 10 days of infections or before uh, 10 days of the infection, or if you're collecting these uh, from active patients, or uh, if you're considering to uh, uh, also study the disease epidemiology, because if you are working with, for example, in my case, that I work with arbor biology, we need to understand uh, the epidemiological background of uh, your uh, uh, affected population, and we need to also try this new diagnostic for uh, primary infection patient, patients or secondary infection patients. So this could affect because we know that a prior uh, immune response could affect our uh, diagnostic performance for some uh, uh, of these viral infections for example. And of course, we need to address always uh, cross-reaction uh, uh, validation. So uh, if we are discussing SARS-CoV-2, we need to do uh, some related respiratory assays, uh, I'm sorry, respiratory disease as well uh, to validate our, our a new tool, new diagnostic uh, uh, assay. So this is uh, really important to consider other uh, positive samples for positive samples for other disease as well as controls. So uh, I understand that uh, tomorrow we will have like a big section about uh, assay validation, but as uh, Marta also pointed out. Uh, earlier, we have different steps. We need to uh, evaluate uh, a lot of different criteria. We need to understand the analytical performance of this uh, assay and also the diagnostic performance, uh, establish uh, some cutoffs for these methods, and of course, understand uh, the reproducibility of your assay. It's also uh, quite important uh, to perform uh, before this go to uh, a, a, a technology transfer uh, um, step. So uh, all of us understand uh, the types of diagnostic assays. Uh, usually we work with uh, major uh, two sections that are the serological assays and the molecular assays, but we are used to uh, um, solve uh, assays like ELISA, letter flow, and neutralization assays for serological applications and uh, PCR, quantitative PCR, or even hybridization assays for uh, molecular uh, uh, trials. But it's also important to understand that we have some new alternatives or new technology, new uh, uh, technologies, as well as some of um, major biosensors uh, that could be electronic, optical, or chemical. And we also have this huge and now uh, even commercialized uh, beta rays that could be also uh, uh, applied for serological aspects. And of course, uh, flow cytometry that used to be more an academic tool, but now we have like these big institutes and hospitals that are working with uh, respiratory panels uh, for uh, cytometry or HIV uh, uh, follow up of patients with flow cytometry. So it's quite uh, important to know and uh, or even develop. Uh, some panels or some uh, diagnostics using this tool. 
And for uh, molecular assays, we have like uh, the sky's limit. Uh, we have so many different and uh, amazing tools nowadays. We have, uh, for example, here, uh, we have LAMP or CRISPR uh, assays that could be used as a diagnostic tool as well. So we have like not only PCR or ELISA, a letter of flow to, to uh, trial, but also uh, a lot of um, injured um, um, assays that we could also try and understand and even establish in your lab. Uh, as uh, also the previous um, talk uh, showed to you, uh, today we have also to think about the readouts or the results that we have with different types of uh, diagnostic assays. Uh, for example, today we uh, pretty much work with two uh, types of assays when we think about uh, results and the performance. We have the point of care that basically can perform it uh, near or even at the point of the patient care. They are easy to use, they are portable, they have low costs, do not require power or additional reagents. And most importantly, uh, we have the results in just uh, minutes to 15 to 30 minutes for uh, most of these uh, point of care assays but also uh, they uh, usually present inaccuracy, low sensitivity. Uh, they are uh, single use devices. And we could also uh, have a cross reactivity uh, uh, response in this type of diagnostic assay. Uh, on the other hand, we have the lab basic tests. Uh, in these, the samples are sent to a central lab, lab for the analysis. Uh, in this type of essay, we uh, uh, preferred, uh, we have um, a higher accuracy. We can uh, uh, work with multiplex assays so we can detect different analytes or uh, different uh, um, molecular, uh, uh, I'm sorry, nucleic acids for different disease of pathogens. Uh, for example, uh, we usually have a higher uh, diagnostic performance and these type of tests are more uh, uh, reproducible between them. And usually we discuss high-end technology and these lab-based assays. But of course we have higher costs we need a specialized personnel and equipment, and we need to have like an infrastructure that uh, uh, are related to to the development of these assets. So now I will present to you a little bit of our uh, experience here in Brazil and what we are doing uh, nowadays for a diagnostic development. Uh, but first, I need to talk a little bit about nanotechnology. Uh, that is um, uh, sometimes we uh, do not understand quite well. Uh, but nanotechnology basis is uh, related to the creation, manipulation, or an exploration of materials in on a scale. So if we're doing uh, uh, a diagnostic assay of a nucleic acid, an antibody, or a protein, you are already working at the nanoscale. So you are already in the non-technology world. Uh, but most importantly is that when we work with a material that we have in micro scale, for example, and then we bring this, uh, uh, this material to another scale, uh, we have uh, different in special uh, uh, properties related to these nanomaterials because pretty much all the physical and chemical properties of a matter are related to the electrons motion. And, and if we confine these uh, electrons in um, uh, such a small uh, um, uh, scale material, we will have different motions of the electric and then we have uh, different uh, properties for these uh, materials. 
So uh, especially in my group, we work with different kinds of uh, nanomaterials, uh, carbon-based nanomaterials as the theme or carbon nanotubes. But nowadays, uh, we and pretty much the whole nanomedicine uh, 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 groups are working with gold nanoparticles. Uh, those particles have uh, a strong optical uh, peak that we could vary and uh, study in different shapes of uh, nanoparticles. They are electron bands, so we can use for uh, microscopies or biological microscopies, uh, 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 assays that we already have in our researcher labs. Uh, and its surface, the chemical surface, allows bound the, the binding of different uh, molecules, so we can play uh, with these nanoparticles, gold nanoparticles, and establish different tools uh, or different platforms uh, that you can you can build or construct uh, uh, following your uh, diagnostic uh, desire. Uh, so um, the first. Uh, uh, result of our group that I want to show you is that we work also uh, with some uh, um, new or in silico uh, evaluation of uh, the proteins or the genome of the virus that we want to study. And with this in silico uh, evaluation, we can identify uh, a specific epitopes. In this case here, we are working with these cell epitopes that could be potential uh, tools for diagnostic, for example, in, in dengue infections. So uh, for this case, we uh, identified some of these epitopes and we uh, um, uh, how can I say, synthesized uh, these peptides in membranes and then we run uh, some tests to understand which one are the most uh, um, potent, uh, uh, potential uh, epitope for uh, these uh, for dengue diagnostic, for example. And then we are, we are doing some conservative epitopes for all of four uh, uh, stereotypes of dengue, but uh, we are trying to avoid cross reaction with another flood virus such as yellow fever or Zika virus uh, in our say. And then we uh, uh, synthesize soluble, the best soluble peptide that we have uh, in this screening. And then we trial this with uh, human samples and then we have like a good result. However, uh, in this case, uh, our best peptide was from the region of the protein NS4B, and then we have really, really low uh, OD uh, results in our uh, peptide ELISA. And this was a, quite a problem uh, and a troubleshooting that we need to uh, evaluate, evaluate in our uh, development of a new assay. Uh, this is probably because of the amount of, of, of concentration of peptide in our. Um, in our assay, or even uh, when we have related uh, specific antibodies for NS4B, then we have a lower response. So this is uh, important to understand uh, the, the analyte that you're choosing for your diagnostic tool and how this will respond when uh, we try this with real life samples. Uh, in the other hand, we have uh, uh, this different type of uh, peptide selection that we use, uh, epitope library, and then we uh, did this screening with monoclonal antibiotic, uh, antibodies. These monoclonal antibodies was specific for dengue and for Zika. Uh, so we choose like some uh, best response for uh, dengue and best response for Zika. And then we synthesized this peptide and, and we validated them with human serum from an endemic area. And here we have like a really uh, major uh, enhancement of the uh, OD, of course, that we are talking here about peptides from 
uh, a more monodominant protein that is uh, NS1. So we expect it to have like this, this better results because we have uh, uh, NS1 circulated at uh, our serum. So we have a better uh, antibody response spe specifically for this uh, protein. So we have here uh, uh, a discrimination between uh, dengue positive and ZD positive sera for a specific uh, uh, dengue peptide and for a specific uh, zero peptide. And after that, we use these peptides to try to establish a multiplex lateral flow assay. So we put them on a strip and then we run some assays to determine the limit of detection and how these work with uh, the monoclonal antibodies that we use it for uh, the selection of these peptides. But also we use these to try to uh, validate our uh, data software that we uh, developed in our uh, research network. Uh, in this um, software, we capture and processing the data uh, in a mob mobile phone. And then we see here that we have uh, differentiation between the positive and the negative, or in this case, the dengue monoclonal antibody uh, recognizing a dengue uh, peptide and a Zika antibody that is negative uh, for this peptide. So uh, we also trying to improve the signaling or uh, um, try to uh, uh, develop a better system to for the the, the letter of full essays results that didn't depend of the naked eye uh, uh, evaluation. Uh, and in the same uh, uh, set of uh, uh, um, experience uh, experiment, I'm sorry, uh, we also try to improve. Uh, the lateral flow signaling. Uh, for this, uh, we are using another uh, uh, technique that, that's called SIRS. In SIRS, we have like the surface enhancement Raman spectroscopy that we, uh, we, uh, we, we use uh, some optical properties of the metallic surface. Uh, and then for this assay, we also conjugate some reporters, some nanotags that have different colors. So we put, uh, for example, for Zika, an tag with the color blue, and for Dengue, an tag with the color uh, red. And then we run the test. And in the same test, we have both of nanoparticles with the blue nanotags and the green nanotags and the red nanotags. And uh, in the same area that we have a positive response for all of them, uh, that visually, by the naked eye, we can distinguish between dengue or Zika infection. We, using this search technique, we can uh, see that we have a uh, specific Zika infection or a dengue infection, or even a mixture of both. Uh, and that this patient has both antibodies for both disease. So, in a, this is a multiplex single. Uh, sample assay that we uh, improve the signaling and the interpretation of results using a nanoparticle and uh, optical properties of this nanoparticle. But the main goal of my research group and my uh, particular uh, uh, research uh, line um, is to use some of these optical properties of gold nanoparticles that is called uh, localized surface plasma resonance uh, in this uh, uh, optical uh, property when we placed uh, a light beam uh, in this uh, nanoparticle, we have a resonance of the electric. And that is so, so, so strong that we have uh, the establishment of an electric field in this nanoparticle. And this electrical field is, we can read with uh, a spectrometer. And we use these for to analyze the absorption spectrum of these nanoparticles. But most importantly, is uh, if we are depending on the electric cloud and we put a biological molecule 
on the surface of the net, these nanoparticles, we will have an specific uh, uh, absorption spectrum. But if we, these nanoparticles interact with, uh, uh, I'm sorry, if this biomolecule, this protein, this antigen, uh, uh, by with an specific antibody, uh, then we have uh, a displacement. We, we have a shift of these absorption spectrum. So we have uh, um, the readouts of these uh, these interaction between uh, the antigen and an antibody at the surface of this nanoparticle. So our first trial with uh, these type of nanosensors was for dengue. So we built uh, four different uh, nanosensors for dengue one, two, three, and four. And then we, um, we first of all, we validated uh, these nanosensors uh, with uh, monoclonal antibodies. And then we have here this huge displacement for all of the, the our uh, specific uh, nanosensors with monoclonal antibody. Uh, and as well, when we try at these with human uh, pulsera, we also saw a huge uh, shift in our spectrum uh, with different uh, um, with different dilutions of the human serum. But when we try this with controls, uh, negative controls, or even uh, yellow fever and uh, uh, different types of uh, flavivirus that circulate here in Brazil, we have like a negative shift. But for dengue positive serum, we have uh, a huge uh, displacement and uh, shift on this spectrum. But most importantly, when we do this, uh, between we analyze this between dengue and Zika positive serum, we have uh, that our sensor is also quite specific for dengue and didn't uh, um, have a um, uh, shift uh, for uh, Zika uh, serum, human serum. And here is a condensed results for all of them. We have also. Uh, this type of nanosensor, it's not only specific for dengue, uh, they are also specific for a serotype. So the dengue uh, one nanosensor responds quite well for uh, dengue one patients uh, and the same for dengue two, dengue three, and dengue four. Um, after that, we, uh, of course, uh, try to establish a nanosensor for uh, COVID-19 as well. Uh, in this case, our first step was to establish and validate um, anti-IgG uh, ELISA for the nucleocapsid protein for uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and then we have uh, great uh, results for an NTN uh, ELISA that we have uh, our uh, reference method that PCR, so we took a uh, positive PCR patient, and then we have uh, a really, really good performance of our ELISA, and we have a sensitivity uh, of 93% and a specificity of 100% when we are uh, talking about uh, um, PCR positive, positive patients with more than 10 days of infection. And then uh, we uh, come back to the lab, nonetheless, and uh, try to establish our nanosensor. And then we, um, we achieve a good uh, binding of this, this uh, protein with our uh, protocol. Uh, and then we have uh, different characterizations of these uh, nanoplatform that uh, shows us that they are stable and then we can use uh, also as well uh, these nanosensor uh, for a diagnostic um, assay. It's uh, quite important uh, also to uh, evaluate if your tool is uh, stable, not only the, the biological reaction and the, the result that we have uh, between the antibody and antigen, uh, binding, but it's 
uh, also important to understand how your uh, nano sensor or your uh, uh, tool is uh, working with the other analytes and if it's stable and then if uh, uh, you need to do a, a whole characterization of your tool before do some validations, biological validation. Uh, so uh, we also uh, developed in our lab a clonal antibody for these uh, proteins, are called two protein, the nucleocapsid protein, and then we also saw a, like a huge uh, uh, recognition of our protein and the specific clonal antibody, and then we ran some um, experiments using human serum. Uh, uh, positive or negative uh, samples that we uh, validated not only in uh, PCR, but also in our ELISA uh, assay. And for this, we also saw like a good response. And then not only we recognize uh, the high positive for ELISA, the OD uh, absorbance in ELISA, but also we identify the low positives, like really close to cutoff, the ELISA cutoff, and they are uh, uh, positive. And also even the undetermined uh, uh, patient that we uh, have uh, different responses in ELISA, we are able to identify. And this shows us how sensitive is uh, this technology uh, in comparison to, to a more classical uh, um, essays. Uh, and just to finish uh, this type of our experience with uh, development of uh, diagnostics, we also uh, are trying to do some of uh, technology improvements and we started this with full cytometry. Uh, we know that uh, some our particles when uh, have optical properties, as I said. And then uh, if we use uh, um, a nanoparticle that with the scattering, the, the, the light scattering of this nanoparticle is close to a fluorescence uh, uh, also without, then we can, can combine the nanoparticle fluorescence, uh, uh, intrinsic fluorescence. And uh, the fluorophore, and then we will have like this synergic effect. So we have like a better results for your uh, full cytometry with low antibody concentrations. So uh, this is uh, quite important. If your sample or your patient, patient have low concentration of antibodies or uh, low uh, uh, immune response, or even if you want to uh, try to do your assay cheaper uh, using a low concentration of uh, uh, control antibodies or secondary antibodies. So this is uh, the type of enhancement that we can have using our technology. So uh, some questions that we need to think about is how to choose when you're choosing your technology is uh, basically uh, what it, it will be the cost of this technology and uh, what is the time of readouts. Uh, for example, nanosensors work uh, like um, um, lateral flow assays. So we have uh, our uh, results in 50 minutes, 30 minutes. Uh, and then if this is a, a, a quite an improvement uh, in comparison to other serological essays like ELISA, uh, we don't need to have uh, uh, other reagents. Um, we don't need a uh, secondary antibody or uh, substrate or a uh, revelation set, uh, but we need um, uh, um, a reader, we need an equipment to uh, analyze these results. So we have like a better uh, sensitivity and specificity uh, compared to uh, the low, the, the letter of flow assay. But we also need to consider that in some affected populations, we don't, we don't have the chance to 
pick up the sample and bring to the lab, we it's better to uh, do the assay or have this response at the patient care. So this is how you uh, uh, choose the technology that you want to use your in your uh, assay. Um, and that depends of where you are applying this. Uh, of course, we need also to understand the disease outcome. Uh, for example, for COVID-19, uh, if my uh, diagnostic assay has a lot of false positives, that is not so, uh, um, I'm carefully saying that, uh, this is not so important or this is not a feature that could be a major problem because if you have the results of positive, these patients should be uh, quarantined and you have like a break chain of the transmission. But if your COVID-19 essay has a lot of false negatives, so a positive patient will uh, circulate or have interaction with negative uh, uh, person, and then we will have like uh, 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 the, the the circulation and the transmission of this uh, disease. So uh, it's quite important to understand your uh, disease outcome and where uh, if you need to choose a technique that have false more false negatives or more false positives, you need to put this in a balance. Uh, especially for those with low uh, tax requirement. Uh, and of course, we need to uh, understand the co-circulation of similar pathogens uh, in this population, this affected population, because uh, this will require uh, you to think if you need more a sensitive or more specific technique. So uh, these are our uh, uh, criteria that you need to understand before to choose your assay technology. Of course, if you have an interdisciplinary research group, uh, you can uh, combine uh, the background, the technological uh, background, and the biological, medical, or uh, the availability, uh, the, the uh, uh, samples or uh, controls that we have. Uh, to play a little bit with these type of assays and try to understand which one is better for each uh, uh, disease or each um, epidemiological uh, aspect of your affected population. So uh, it's quite important uh, to have like some partners that could help you uh, to develop some uh, uh, essays that could perform differently uh, if you uh, uh, try to, to um, understand or to uh, work in a different epidemiological um, aspects. Uh, and at the end, we need to discuss new diseases. Uh, uh, this, as COVID-19 proved to us, it's quite challenging uh, and it's important uh, for us that have well-established academic techniques uh, to try to gain market or to prove in real life if our uh, technology that we are developing as a lab uh, work in a real life situation. So we, uh, the market for uh, diagnostic tools, it's quite a conservative. Uh, we have, uh, great examples. We have amazing uh, papers at literature with amazing techniques, but we don't see them at uh, a commercial available. Uh, so it's quite important to uh, try to apply our techniques in our real life uh, um, uh, challenging. So uh, this is uh, when we have emerging disease or re-emerging disease uh, could be uh, an opportunity for us to uh, try to understand if our uh, technology can be transferred for the market. And at the end of this uh, talk, uh, it's quite important to 
understand that, like how to deal with emerging or re-emerging pathogens. So for these, we need to rapidly develop or deploy diagnostic testing methods. We need to develop uh, some case definitions and type testing criteria, as I said. Uh, we need to engage public health partners to optimize our response capacity and the coordination of response. Uh, we need, of course, to establish information sharing process procedures and samples to support surveillance of these new pathogens and establish, uh, establish a genomic and other omics approach to further enhance uh, infectious disease uh, uh, response capacity. And how we do this, we do this with uh, the establishment of a uh, network. So in our case here in Brazil, we have like three or four great examples. Uh, we will start this with a uh, Zika plan. Probably most of you are, have a better understanding of the Zika plan than I do. We are like, uh, we have a partnership with uh, Sao Paulo University that is part of the Zika plan. And uh, this is what's really important to Brazil uh, uh, during the outbreak of uh, Zika. Uh, and then this brings us to uh, talk more between uh, research groups here in Brazil and share uh, samples and share uh, protocols or antibodies or uh, uh, sequences uh, to understand what was happening in different regions of Brazil. Uh, later on, we have the establishment of uh, the CAD project. Uh, this is a center for alphavirus discovery, diagnostic, and surveillance, uh, molecular epidemiology, uh, basically, that we also share uh, our samples and our uh, uh, sequencing uh, to understand where is the, the, the next uh, uh, great uh, outbreak that we will have uh, regarding our video have a virus here uh, in Brazil. And later on, we have established a, a national network uh, that brings together uh, researcher and even government uh, uh, representatives and institutes that uh, lead us, us in uh, the COVID-19 situation here in Brazil. Uh, for this network, we have different kinds of uh, approaches or initiatives. Uh, we have uh, the OMEX uh, uh, initiative that is uh, for sequencing of our uh, mutants and uh, how to understand uh, the spread of COVID-19 in Brazil. Uh, we also have some branched vaccine projects. Uh, these vaccines are like 100% for uh, major of these. Uh, based on uh, Brazilian technology and Brazilian institutes. So this is quite important to us. Uh, of course, that we have also an open share uh, uh, distribution of uh, protocols, samples, and even uh, virus to help us to establish our uh, diagnostic assays and uh, the sequencing uh, uh, controls for our um, new uh, omics uh, uh, research uh, uh, labs in different uh, regions of Brazil. And we also have uh, this huge uh, branch of serological assay development. And then we have like all of these with uh, national technology that's only uh, able uh, because of these uh, initiatives. Uh, of course, it's so important to talk about cross-validation of uh, this assay, not only the molecular ones, but the serological ones. So we send uh, the, the assay that we developed for in different regions of Brazil and different institutes, and they validate it our 
uh, uh, assay with uh, samples from, from that uh, epidemiological background. And then we have like better result and a better analysis of our diagnostic performances because this cross validation. So uh, I just want to talk a little bit of our newest uh, network. It's called a uh, created new, uh, integrated new. We have like a coordination research uh, a group that is uh, or network that is uh, uh, based for to understand a network to understand the surveillance and, uh, um, outbreaks, sorry, <laughs> to understand uh, the outbreaks of new emerging our providers. Uh, our uh, site of research uh, is basically uh, Central and South America, uh, but we also uh, need, our mission is to address uh, some uh, emerging or any of uh, kind of emerging uh, zoological or vector-borne uh, disease that we are constantly uh, um, uh, taking care and uh, watching these uh, particular regions of the globe. Um, I would like uh, to present to you some of our uh, uh, research group. Uh, the PI of my lab is Dr. Maurizio Nogueira, uh, but we also have this huge uh, uh, network uh, between uh, the Texas University uh, with uh, Dr. Nicholas Bezalex and also uh, with uh, Dr. Uh, Gerg from MIT, that is our uh, one of our basic uh, uh, development essays uh, uh, features in our network. Uh, also, I would like to uh, uh, introduce you to my personal uh, research group. Uh, and let's call it a uh, nanobiomedical research group here in Brazil. And then you have uh, in the audience uh, Dr. Vigia and Dr. Stefania that could help you with some questions about uh, the nanotechnology development and how to implement this in your own labs. Uh, and I would like to uh, thank you all uh, the attention and I'm open for uh, the QA. Uh, um, answer later on. Thank you so much, Alisi. That's a very interesting overview and interesting to see new technologies um, being applied to diagnostics. So uh, there are some questions coming up in the Q&A, but we'll take those in a bit. Um, and please keep your questions coming. And we're going to go to our last presentation now. Um, so I'd like to introduce uh, our two speakers. We have Palma Natongo. Uh, Palma has lots of um, affiliations. So um, Palma is an assistant professor of biology at N uh, NTU in the USA. Uh, also a senior lecturer at the University of Yaoundé in Cameroon and a training lead of ALERT. Um, he's done lots of work um, for WHO in Geneva in Switzerland, founded a molecular diagnostic research group uh, in Cameroon and has been in the USA to learn about animal models of malaria immunology and is currently working as assistant professor of biology at, at NTU. So thank you for agreeing to speak today, Palmer. We're looking forward to your presentation. We also have uh, Madison Stark, who's a lead laboratory scientist on research and design co-diagnostics incorporated at Salt Lake City in Utah. Um, and he's been involved in validating several molecular diagnostics tests, um, which have ended up with RUO, IVD, CE, and FDA approval uh, for many global infectious diseases um, that we know of. So uh, MTB, Zika, Dengue, Chikungunya, Malaria, etc. cetera. Um, and he's been heavily involved in uh, uh, manufacturing production of COVID-19 tests uh, to meet global demand for these tests. So welcome to you both and thank you for agreeing to speak and I'll hand over to you for your presentation now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and I think that I will keep my casket of alert uh, work package five, which is in charge of training lead today. So 
Uh, I am very grateful to our sister network, uh, Pandora, because uh, what alert is, is the African Coalition for Epidemic Research Response and Training. And so my humble self, I'm in charge of training with all these institutions uh, down here listed. And so basically today, what uh, Work Package 5 will be doing is what we do best, which is basically uh, trying to uh, enhance uh, capacity for operational research in Africa alongside our member partners in our network. We try to make sure that we provide training and capacity building and these we ensure uh, that it is also sustained even after uh, our funding from EDCTP will be gone. And we are very grateful to EDCTP for that. And so today as a network then doing what we do best, we thought that we should try to uh, see how we can uh, enhance capacity for real-time PCR uh, diagnosis for infectious diseases. And these, we basically are going to explore this novel uh, co-primer technology, which I will leave Madison to uh, be able to handle because uh, the company that Madison works for co-diagnostics is the uh, uh, holds proprietary rights for this technology. So uh, it will be good to listen to Madison directly. I'll try to keep myself very brief, basically saying that the reason why we chose this was to follow up on John Kengasson of uh, African CDC's call uh, ahead of the second wave of COVID-19 that we needed to do more in test of testing. And this, of course, was echoed by the African Society for Laboratory Medicine that created and launched then this uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, echo sessions. And these sessions, I'm inviting listeners to uh, really go and watch them, especially, uh, especially session number 24 and session number 33. They are very important related to this uh, aspect that we are talking about real-time PCR diagnosis. And so for this real-time uh, reverse transcriptase uh, based uh, diagnosis, we will uh, settle today on COVID-19 because uh, the turnaround time is still a problem for most of our uh, partners and African countries. And of course, echoing from the Minister of Health in Ghana, uh, it is uh, clear that more uh, labs needs to be set up to be able to handle this kind of uh, testing across the region. So why we'll settle on that, Madison's presentation will basically present uh, the technology of the co-primer answering these basic four questions. And so participants uh, should look up for uh, when Madison comes up after me. So for COVID-19, basically what we know is that we know the virus now and we know it's a positive uh, sense, a single strand uh, uh, RNA virus. We know that it's uh, one of the beta coronaviruses. We know that it has many of these uh, proteins that can be exploited for its diagnosis either singly, especially for the spike protein, which is the majority of the proteins on the surface, or in combination with other ones, including even a non-structural uh, protein of the virus. And so keeping it simple, we would uh, have Madison talk about how her company has used this strategy to develop uh, this uh, novel method for diagnosis. And so just to say what we have currently as capacity for real-time PCR diagnosis in the continent, I'll limit myself to our uh, responses that we've res uh, we just received uh, recently from a survey that is still going on, and I'll paste the questions again on the chat so that people can contribute. Basically, we know that uh, real-time PCR is still uh, not routine uh, diagnosis practice, and I know that that is changing now, even in very, uh, some of the accredited labs. And I say these because also in a very major document that uh, WHO put out for accreditation of labs, in fact, real-time PCR diagnosis is only mentioned in the abbreviations and doesn't even appear in the document uh, itself. So I put that document here and you can always go back and reference it. We try to ask about research labs and we still know that this technology is not still available for some of the labs. I don't know about your country, but most of the countries that we talk to some of them don't still have it in their research labs. And even uh, 
uh, when we did that survey, the responses that came in, Southern Africa here, for instance, doesn't have any responses that we got. But what we got from uh, uh, West Africa, East Africa, and Central Africa is that, yes, the technology is there up to about 60% of the time. What uh, they will use for COVID diagnosis uh, would be a real-time PCR test. But then also a rapid diagnostic test is coming up. And I guess this is just from the responses which we got. And I'm sure as the responses come in, this figure will change drastically. And so when uh, we realized in these labs from what uh, we were told that even when they have a real-time PCR system, it's only reserved for the what we call elite laboratory scientists and the technicians are not able to access it easily. Of course, we understand that the reason is because of its cost and the cost of these equipment, which I'll show later in the next slide, is uh, tremendously expensive. And some of the tests, in fact, this is from the uh, Africa CDC website. They range from anywhere between 10 to $20 per test. And uh, I think the good news here is that the co-primer platform that Madison will be prepare, uh, presenting it will go on that uh, $10 per test. And so when we mention uh, these uh, uh, costs, uh, we are talking about because the technology as we know is very sophisticated. And going back to the teacher that I am, I'm just presenting that for all the samples that you need, whether it's swabs or it's a saliva or nasopharyngeal aspirates, you would need one of those uh, very uh, 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 systems that are out there to be able to uh, collect the sample properly, transport it, uh, or store it before you take it to the central lab where you go and meet these uh, sophisticated equipment that have been put there. And this is a plethora of them that I've listed here, but going just from the prices, which I've just indicated here, and this you can get from uh, any website that you check, but these prices I took from the African CDC uh, uh, platform, you would realize that these are the big boys down here for real-time PCR system, the Quantstu Studio 5 and 6, and then, of course, the uh, Applied Biosystem 7,500 uh, FAST. But this is my favorite, then, the one that uh, Co-Diagnostics has, which is quite small, as you can see it. And the price, of course, is uh, very generous. And small doesn't really mean ineffective. It is, in fact, very, very effective. Because with all of these systems, you may need to centrifuge samples before you go and uh, put them in the machine. But with this system, you don't really need that because it uses uh, a magnetic technology that has uh, some kind of centrifugation incorporated into it. And so with that, you can easily just get your samples in there and then plug and play for all their uh, softwares, which are graciously provided by the company uh, Co-Diagnostics. And so uh, for all of these uh, techniques, definitely, yes, you are told that we need uh, specialized personnel to be able to handle them. And these specialized personnel need just to have uh, uh, an idea of what is going on in terms of the principle. And so I share a couple of what we know so far. And basically, we know, again, back to the classroom, for those of you who are not uh, uh, too savvy with this, is uh, that real-time PCR so far has been based uh, on uh, intercalating dye method. And the best that we know of is a cyber green. And I mentioned here medium specificity and that you need well-designed primers. It's just because basically what cyber green does, as we know, it intercalates anything that is double-stranded DNA. So if your primers are uh, mispriming and uh, amplifying uh, uh, the wrong sequence, you will still be able to, in real time, detect the dye. And Madison has some issues, uh, some slides on this, so I will not go too uh, much on that to give her time to be able to do her presentation. The other one, of course, that we have is the Tagman. And Tagman is, uh, I think, uh, one of the best that we have out there. Uh, it uh, also needs uh, not only just a primer, but needs a probe that is attached to uh, a dye, uh, and then, of course, a quencher. And uh, as amplification, of course, of course, the quencher is separated from the, uh, the fluorophore, and then you start seeing fluorescence. And because of that, it uh, entails that you need to synthesize uh, many primers and many probes. 
and that of course has an impact on the cry and the price, which makes it goes up uh, tremendously. But as we heard from the first uh, presentation from Find, some of you may want to really be interested in developing this on your own. So I thought that I should share one uh, basic platform that I use uh, to be able to get some tips. And that is, of course, Ask from Tatman, which if you go in there, you will understand that some of the basics that you need will basically be to, first of all, ensure that your uh, sequence that you are targeting to amplify is not very large. You want to keep it to this limit of uh, 50 to 150 base pairs. We want to avoid you know, uh, getting to put your sequences towards where you will have uh, uh, specific mutations, especially, except if that's what you are specifically targeting, because these would help uh, to push your uh, CQ or, C or CTs uh, towards the right. And so you may have a, a wrong uh, interpretation of your results. You want to also make sure that you are targeting very unique sequences and these unique sequences that can give you a product. And if you are furthermore interested, and this again, you can get from Tagman, is that you don't want uh, to target your sequence, uh, your primers to uh, uh, any repeating sequence like lines, like signs and transposons and uh, all these other ones. And so I, I just flag these because I think the purpose of my presence here is mostly to introduce Madison to you and say that the technology that they have has been really customized. And uh, you know we've been able to deploy that, say for instance, with uh, Native American students and undergrad students uh, could be able to pick up this technology and just uh, hit the road. So they can do those diagnoses. I don't see why any uh, uh, student from uh, or technician from our labs cannot be able to do that. And so hopefully when these technologies well received and deployed in uh, our continent, we would have uh, many more uh, uh, capacities to be able to handle uh, real-time diagnosis, which by no means is uh, any short of all those other expensive ones that are out there. And so on that, I announced that we would have an enlarged workshop on June 10, organized by Alert this time on this technology. So uh, if you don't get much from uh, this 30 minute brief, which we plan to really keep it to 30 minutes, you can always come back on June 10th uh, and uh, the Global Health Network will be helping us to set this up again. And so uh, on that note, I'll say uh, Asante Sana. And then of course, I'm going to introduce uh, Mari from Co Diagnostics to be able to deliver her presentation on the Co Primer uh, platform and technology. Mari, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Palmer. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and start my presentation. All right, uh, my presentation today is going to focus on the specifics of how PCR works on the molecular level and how the technology of co-primers uh, can greatly improve upon one of the gold standards of diagnostics and widely benefit and facilitate the rapid development of highly reliable molecular diagnostics for emerging and infectious diseases. Um, I'll introduce myself in co-diagnostics. As Palmer said, my name is Madison Stark. Uh, I am a laboratory scientist in the research and development division at Codiagnostics, and I have been developing and researching molecular diagnostic tests since 2017 with Codiagnostics. Uh, Codiagnostics is based out of Salt Lake City, Utah in America, and builds robust and innovative molecular tools for detection of infectious diseases, liquid biopsy for cancer screening and agricultural applications, especially to the regions where pricing is paramount. Our proprietary molecular diagnostics technology is paving the way for innovation in disease detection and life sciences research through our enhanced detection of genetic material. Because we own our co-primer technology and platform, we can accomplish this faster and more economically, allowing for wider margins while still positioning co-diagnostics to be the worldwide low cost leader of molecular diagnostic services. We have a variety of tests available that all have our co-primer technology and our Codex box thermocycler that has the footprint of about a gallon of milk, but has the punch to perform as well as or better than other thermocyclers on the market for a fraction of the cost. 
Uh, it is plug and play and boasts some of the most interpretable software out there. Co-diagnostics and our co-primer technology utilizes a diagnostic method uh, called real-time RT-PCR, which many of you are very intimately uh, familiar with. But PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction and was developed by Nobel Prize winner Carrie Mullis in 1993. Uh, it is a method used to rapidly make millions to billions of copies of a specific nucleic acid sample. Real-time PCR is PCR that is tracked actively in real time. And RT-PCR refers to using reverse transcriptase to turn a starting material of RNA into a DNA template. And real-time RT-PCR is using an RNA template as your starting material and observing the process of amplicon generation in the reaction at any time during the process. Uh, PCR consists of four different components, a DNA or RNA template or a purified patient sample as your starting material. DNA polymerase and reverse transcriptase, if your starting material is RNA-based, primers and nucleotides. Primers are specific nucleotide sequences that bind to its complementary target. The PCR process is simply a series of heating and cooling cycles that allow the DNA to separate, the denaturing stage, primers to bind to their target, the annealing stage, uh, and an extending stage where the polymerase creates a complementary copy of the genetic, genetic material. Uh, this is occurring rapidly in both directions. Uh, here is a little graphic uh, more in detail of what is occurring within one PCR cycle. The image on the right is what is happening to the copy number each cycle. It increases exponentially as copies are made until the building blocks of the reaction run out which is where that linear and plateau are visualized in that image. This is where I would like to introduce uh, co-diagnostics co-primer technology. There are three parts to the co-primer. The first is the primer sequence, that's the little blue. Uh, this functions exactly as a traditional Temp, uh, exactly as a traditional primer, uh, with the exception that it is very, very short and has an extremely low melting temperature, or TM, uh, to the tune of 5 to 20 degrees Celsius below the reaction temperature. This means that the, the primer in free reaction would not bind to anything, uh, including its desired target. In order to facilitate amplicon um, of the desired target, the, uh, the priming sequence is connected via a flexible insert linker, uh, usually made with uh, polyethylene glycol and adenine chains to a capture sequence, which is that purple section that has a higher melting temperature and can bind in free reaction. When the capture binds, the primer is brought into an artificially close proximity to its target, uh, increasing the local concentration of that primer in the area by approximately 10,000 times. This allows even the very low TM primer to bind consistently and amplify at a high efficiency. This means that if we label the capture with a fluorescent pair, we can generate amplification signal even without the inclusion of a separate probe molecule. Sorry about that. Uh, the structure of co-primer increases its specificity and reduces nonspecific amplification in three main ways. Uh, first, since there are two parts to the molecule, uh, two separate binding events must occur uh, to facilitate any amplification. This makes it less likely that anything besides the desired target uh, will enable both events to happen simultaneously. Second, since the priming sequence is so short, we have shown that a properly placed mismatch has an extremely powerful destabilizing effect on the primer, such that coprimers are able to differentiate between single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs, at a much higher capability than traditional primers. Uh, and third, coprimers are capable of virtually preventing primer dimer formation. Primer dimers occur when your primer interacts with things other than your desired target. Uh, this can happen due to affinity or just random collisions. Uh, when this happens, it's called nonspecific amplification, and lots of us deal with this in this field. Um, when your forward and your reverse coprimers or primers interact with one another, it's called primer dimer formation. Uh, and it is especially dangerous in the PCR world, 
as this is where you generate false positives, since you can't tell real amplification and primer dimer formation from one another. Uh, to mitigate this, most PCR reactions use a hot start polymerase, which prevents primer dimers from forming prior to the first cycle in the reaction, although it doesn't stop them from forming or amplifying after that. Uh, this usually gives us enough of a head start that the test can perform correctly before primer dimers start causing issues. However, when we start to multiplex and increase the number of primers in the reaction, uh, the number of possible primer dimer interactions increases exponentially. Uh, this is why traditional PCR never has a multiplex of more than two to three and sometimes maybe four targets in the same reaction. Uh, coprimers completely bypass uh, this incredibly pesky and troublesome problem because the linker here imaged in green uh, includes that polyethylene glycol um, or another polymerase uh, extension blocker. Um, any primer dimers that are formed whether by affinity or random collision, cannot extend past that priming sequence. This means that the primer dimer itself will have a melting temperature too low to bind and amplify with any reasonable efficiency. Coprimers are the only technology that prevents primer dimer formation uh, even after they are initially formed. This allows us to apply coprimers in a way that would be impossible for traditional primers, such as massively multiplexing, library multiplexing, enhanced differentiation for SNPs or liquid biopsy applications, and even multiplexing those differentiation tests. Um, it is important to note that coprimers can replace any application currently being performed by traditional primers and gain the enhanced specificity of coprimers. To mitigate this, um, oh, excuse me, um, I wanted to touch briefly on some other technologies for PCR that are commonplace for disease detection. Uh, TACMAN probes are sort of the original design for PCR, and many other tests on the market successfully employ their use um, in infectious disease detection. Traditional PCR requires a forward primer, a reverse primer, uh, and a fluorescently labeled probe, uh, whether TACMAN or otherwise, for every marker you would like to target in a reaction. However, for coprimers, uh, you only need a forward coprimer and a reverse coprimer since the coprimer itself can be labeled and generate a signal uh, without the addition of a probe at all. This allows us to completely save the cost of adding the extra molecule while still providing the massively specific increase uh, and reduction in primer dimers inherent to uh, coprimers. Uh, cyber green or other intercalating dyes um, are another way of observing amplification of a target during PCR amplification. Uh, here it involves a fluorescent dye that releases signal proportional to all of the, the double-stranded DNA in the reaction, regardless of the sequence of that DNA. This means that cyber green, as well as other fluorescent dyes, cannot be used to generate signals in multiple channels or differentiate signals from multiple markers. Our tests at Codiagnostics are multiplexed with coprimers labeled with different fluorophore and quencher pairs, and at the very least, they are tuplex, um, a target organism and an internal control. Uh, this means that you can have different markers with separate signal generations for as many channels uh, as your PCR machine can detect. Uh, melting curves analysis um, is another assessment of, of the dissociation characteristics of double-stranded DNA that you generate during a PCR reaction uh, using increased heating temperatures. You can use an intercalating dye to visualize your product and melt curves are very useful for determining the TM uh, and to some degree the approximate length of your amplification product. Uh, this can help you detect the presence of primer dimers and or nonspecific amplification. However, this isn't even needed with coprimers uh, since they are more specific and generate much less nonspecific product. Some uses, such as determining mutations based on the TM of your amplicon, are still helpful and can be done with coprimers as well. Uh, so if you're using melt curves as a crutch to try and make up for your nonspecific amplification from your primers, you no longer need that with coprimers. If you are using melts to get more information than regular cycling can provide, then coprimers can also still be used for that. 
So how does this technology uh, benefit emerging infectious diseases and the response that we have to them? Um, Co-primer technology can be implemented across a wide range of disciplines and can increase the speed, drastically lower the cost, but still heavily compete against other tests on the market in specificity and accuracy of disease detection. Uh, Co-diagnostics commercializes our innovative patented and patent pending technology through sales, development and licensing to quickly develop molecular diagnostics that are more cost effective and perform better than traditional technologies of the past. Uh, because co-primers have unique capabilities beyond that of normal primers, their ability to multiplex and detect SNPs uh, make it possible to accurately identify multiple targets within a single test. Uh, we also utilize an AI, uh, an artificial intelligence, during the design phase of co-primers, uh, which makes co-diagnostics response time and development phase drastically faster uh, than many other companies in the field. Uh, and we have made it a priority to be capable of supplying all components of a functional laboratory to help facilitate response time to the areas of the world uh, in most need of laboratories for testing. Uh, my ultimate goal and the goal of this technology is meant to serve a worldwide market with superior and affordable tests. Um, I'd like to take a moment and thank Pandora and the Global Health Network for allowing me and Co-Diagnostics to participate in this extremely important workshop so that we can collaborate to provide better methods with rapid diagnostics and surveillance uh, in new and ongoing outbreaks. Please reach out to me with any questions or concerns you have about the technology I work with or Denny Crockett who can answer any sales or outreach questions about acquiring our co-primer tests or technology. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Madison and Palmer. Really interesting and really interesting to see some more cost effective solutions uh, to qPCR out there. Um, so we're going to come to our questions, question answer session now. So please post your questions and I can see that there have been some questions and um, our panelists have been very good at answering them uh, on on the chat, but we will maybe take some of those and uh, again and get some more comments. Um, if there are any. I did have a couple of um, other questions that were directed to me in the chat. So I'll just try and uh, find those too, if I can get that box back up. Um, I've got a couple of open questions. So um, we've got one here from Kusala. Uh, application of pro strengthens the test specificity, primer and pros. Isn't this compromise when using co-primer? So that will be to uh, Madison, if you'd like to take that. Okay, all right. So application of probes strengthens the test specificity primers and probes. Isn't this compromised when using co-primers? So no. So as I initially stated that two binding events have to happen in order for those co-primers to bind, um, that capture sequence has to bind down first, which then brings the priming sequence uh, within high capacity to that site, which then allows that low TM primer to sit down. We don't sacrifice any specificity um, when it comes to the co-primer technology. We've just found a way of combining it into one source so that the cost of all of those components gets drastically decreased. Thanks. And, and can you use standard primers and probes if you've already got those optimized on this machine? Yes. Yes, you can. Uh, that's what we love about our CodyX box is that it can be an open system. It is a four channel machine um, and runs 48 samples at a time with a built in centrifuge. Um, it is fantastic. Um, it's just something that you need to reach out to us about and we can answer more questions about that or help you customize your laboratory for use with that machine. Right. So we've got a question here from um, kind of related um, from Cyril. What are the different channels of the code diagnostic real time system? And is it open system or platform? So yeah, partially already answered that. But so um, that's it's four channels. Um, it's green, yellow, orange and red. Um, it's very competitive with other uh, platforms that are on the market, uh, but at a quarter of the cost uh, as other um, thermocyclers that are out there. Amazing and really, really light as well. Well, look at two kilograms. 
<laughs> yeah, sure. I've traveled all over the world with that. And I am so thankful that it fits into a suitcase <laughs> and I can take it with me. I'm not having to haul around a gigantic beast of a machine. I think there are two more in there. Definitely. Uh, sure. I see one that says, what is the maximum number of targets that can be multiplexed with co-primers with best accuracy? So the number of targets is only limited by the number of channels uh, within your, your thermocycler. Um, you, we've been able to multiplex um, 30, 40, 50 pairs of co-primers at a time, but because we're limited by the detection technology out there, uh, we usually stick to about four channels worth. Um, but because they don't have any interaction with one another, uh, we, you, we can multiplex on a very, very high scale. There is a, another one, Madison. How does your PCR compare with Gene Expert? How does your PCR compare with Gene Expert? So, Gene Expert is a fantastic test and it has a wonderful place in the market, but it is expensive and it is very hard to get their equipment out to the countries and the labs that really need it. So, one of the things that Code Diagnostics does is we we like to design and validate our tests on the same um, level as some of these very, very large companies, but make it cost effective and available to the labs that truly need it. Um, that's how come we like to kind of advertise to those smaller labs that can't afford a gene expert or can't um, don't want to test, you know, 380 samples or patients at a time. Uh, so we kind of cater towards those smaller locations um, that don't have the bandwidth or the laboratory space or availability to have much of the larger equipment that's out there. I think to complement that answer, Madison, the gene expert has its place. And as you've basically said it, our targets, I think, in deploying the core box and the core diagnostics uh, core primer platform is basically looking at that gap that exists between our peripheral labs and the centralized system that is happening now, which is what has basically increased the turnaround time for results for these uh, real-time PCR-based uh, diagnosis. And I think one thing that Madison is carefully avoiding is the capacity of running many of these cool boxes from one single computer. And that means that you can run up to 10 of them with one computer at a time and be able to link all of that and get results in real time. So that's something that I think, you know, it, it would be nice to know that you are doing a test in Kumasi, Ghana, and someone is in Accra at the airport with knowing your results on at real time. Oh, that's really exciting. We're going to come and take some questions uh, for the other panelists now as well. So we might come back to you guys in a minute. So Thank, there's a question, you. thank you. So there's a question here from uh, Flavia. Um, how can we make antigen tests which are cheaper and results faster than PCR more available and accessible in low middle income countries? So I think I'll hand that over to uh, Davey and um, Marta, please, and if you want to, to answer that one. Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's a great question, and I think um, it's something that many of the stakeholders in the ACT Accelerator, including Flying Fine, are working on. Um, the first thing that you know we've been working on is ensuring that the prices are affordable. And as I said, uh, pricing has started at about five dollars per test, and it's going down very quickly. Um, there are now certain manufacturers that are committing to two and a half dollars, and we know it's going down. We do know other manufacturers are in the market with uh, lower price tests. Uh, for some of them, the, the performance and the quality hasn't been independently verified. So it's always a balance between um, cost and, and understanding the performance. There are uh, many studies that are being conducted now in countries, um, most of them in Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, um, and the Central and South American region. To, to generate evidence. Many countries, as you know, are requiring uh, in-country registrations uh, in addition to the EUL authorization. So before a manufacturer can sell in country, they need to go through internal evaluations in the countries. So many countries are going through these. Um, these studies are sometimes hard to, hard to conduct and they are long. 
uh, because as I mentioned, these studies need to be prospective in terms of the collection of the samples, but they are ongoing and, and again, Fine, Unity, Chai, and WHO are fostering a lot of these studies, and we're trying to, to accelerate these studies to, to increase update. Other studies that we're conducting is on the operational research side. Can we expand the use cases um, that are happening? And I see that somebody else is asking about procurement. So I'll, I'll follow up on that one because I think it's kind of the, the third piece. You know, the products have been made, they are now at a price that is more affordable. We're generating the evidence to get regulatory authorization and in-country registrations, and then the next one is procurement. Uh, there are certain pool procurement mechanisms, as I mentioned, um, the Global Fund and the Villa Melinda Gates Foundation funded a volume warranty of 100 million tests. What that means is that the Global Fund and the Villa Melinda Gates Foundation are paying for the procurement of those 120 million tests, although that number has gone down to 90, I believe, right now. Um, so those tests are available for procurement. The countries need to reach out uh, proactively to the procurers. Uh, in addition to pool procurement, countries and in the independent agencies can reach out directly to the manufacturers. Um, you know, some organizations have created portals like the ASMP, so where you can buy the test directly. PAHO already has a website uh, with the products that have been um, that are available in the PAHO region. So some of the um, WHO and Global Fund related agencies, Africa CDC, have availability for the um, for the procurement. If you have any questions, we'll be happy to send specific links. Thank you. That's a really comprehensive answer. Uh, so we've got another question here from Flavia. I think maybe Elise or perhaps Davy might like to address this. I'm not sure, but um, it's about Zika tests and are there any reliable ones available? And sort of how's the test? How are the tests progressing so far? So it's quite a general question, but you know, I suppose a lot of emphasis on lots of tests coming out for COVID, but other diseases perhaps not got so many reliable tests available. Um, no, I don't know. Address. I don't know if David could answer um, a more uh, in tune with uh, the academic uh, uh, aspects of uh, the development. Uh, but we have some issues regarding uh, reliable uh, uh, assays, uh, especially for virus. Uh, I understand that uh, uh, we have like a simpler analysis for uh, SARS-CoV-2. We don't have so uh, uh, much cross reactivity uh, between different uh, virus or pathogens. Uh, and the, the global regions that we have, um, SARS-CoV SARS uh, uh, prevalence and antibodies, uh, they are not um, uh, a niche, especially for serological assays, and uh, these, uh, uh, if they are not course circulation, course circulating, they are not uh, such uh, importance for PCR results or uh, active uh, uh, infection uh, type of uh, assays. So if we are, we are talking about antibodies, it could be an issue and this could affect uh, the reliability of uh, the assay. But when we discuss um, long-term uh, immune response uh, infections, such as uh, for the virus or other arboviruses, these could affect uh, your assay and uh, the commercial available uh, um, essay that we have, uh, we, we already saw some of these issues. We have uh, a lot of cross reaction. We have uh, low sensitivity for uh, Zika essays, Shikungunya uh, essays, Ayaro essays. A lot of those, there are vector borne uh, disease we have. Uh, um, problems with the, the, the commercial uh, assay that we already tested in lab with uh, control uh, samples. So, thank you. Do, uh, I don't know if Marta or Davey want to add anything to that. Um, so, but 
it's more specifically about Zika as well. I think known about that. Right. Sure. Um, we, yeah, this is Debbie. We, um, I think uh, maybe a few months or a couple of, you know, a few months ago, we did do a quick landscape of available Zika diagnostics. Um, and I, you know, one of the, one of the main things for the Zika diagnostics is um, when there was um, a huge push in development in 2015, 2016 for Zika diagnostics. And that has waned considerably um, because of the the short the shortish epidemic, um, but that doesn't mean that there aren't you know any smaller outbreaks that are still occurring, um, particularly in um, South America and and um, it could be you know some underlying um, transmissions throughout the world that we just haven't seen yet. Um, in terms of um, availability, I think there's just not much that's been developed, and what is currently available. Um, are, are multiplexed with other arboviruses, which makes sense because um, you know the presentation, early presentation, will be very similar for febrile diseases, um, and that um, as as Alice mentioned, particularly for the antibody-based tests, you still have to contend with a lot of um, a lot of cross-reactivity. Um, and so I do know for the Zika diagnostics, um, particularly for for the WHO, uh, there's a push now for a larger arbovirus, um, um, an arbovirus roadmap to think not just for Zika tests, but uh, beyond for other arbovirus diseases. Um, and I, I believe the London School has a, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine does have a very good landscape of, of Zika diagnostic tests that um, I think that others could, could take a look at. Um, but in terms of availability, um, I, I've, I've not heard much, at least in the commercial space of, of new diagnostic tests. Thanks very much, everyone. So it kind of linked to that, actually some anonymous uh, attendee has posted that a while ago, um, London School performed equipment-based mapping um, based on school level infrastructure, maintenance costs, et cetera. Uh, and they're just wondering if this mapping is being considered when coming up with these novel PCR technologies. Uh, so I don't know, maybe you find, might be able to comment a bit more on how much you're using that uh, when you um, things. Yeah, it looks like Tim has his hand up. So maybe Tim might be <laughs> better in responding to this question. Tim? I can have a go. Um, you, the biggest problem, as you pointed out, really is an endemic countries to discriminate between one flavor virus and another because essentially you'll get reactions to every test you do. Um, and I'll tell you what it says and start my video. Um, so you'll get a reaction to every test that you do, and you can try playing a game that you get a bigger number in one than another, and you may or may not fool yourself into believing one over the other. Um, in non-endemic countries, it's for Zika and serology, it's a little bit easier um, because the cross reactions mostly take place in the IgQ and the IgM. So where you don't have a large background of previous exposure to flaviviruses, you can use the combination of IgG and IgM results with the IgG results and come up with a kind of truth table where if you have no dengue IgM, but you do have a Zika IgM, you will always have a dengue positive and a Zika positive. That's usually Zika, and you can calibrate that on PCR positive samples you had before. Um, it becomes much more difficult, though, if the person's had dengue or something else before. So it's, it really is very poor. And there are a lot of people looking at how you might discriminate the flavor viruses from each other more reliably. And in simple terms, you're likely to have to look at a range of different epitopes and use an artificial intelligence system with a lot of known positives to each disease to come up with a calibration set for using multiple epitopes simultaneously to discriminate between these diseases. They're just too, too similar without very sophisticated analysis. Mm -hmm. There are PCRs though, that helps. And the other thing you can do to improve the 
window in which you can use your PCR is to take a sample of urine at the same time so that in Zika you might get a PCR signal in blood for about four to five days if you're lucky. Uh, if you do it in urine, you can stretch that out to nine. So you've got a bit better chance, even in the latter half of the key disease. That works for dengue in West Nile as well, by the way, and chikungunya. So try a different sample, you might get a bit further. Thanks very much, Tim. So we'll come to a, another question now. So we have uh, another anonymous uh, question, but uh, saying, are, uh, are you forecasting when we'll have technologies that can be used by households? Uh, this is because uh, this person believes that detecting diseases requires community engagement, technologies that are easy to use and are robust. Um, so I don't know who wants to take that. I mean, certainly there are COVID tests now that are being used in the house in the UK for sure, but I don't know how much they've been distributed across the globe, but it'd be interesting to get people's comments on that. Anybody want to volunteer any thoughts on, on this? The household one? Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> and this is, uh, yeah, something that uh, uh, Madison could uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I know that Code Diagnostics is developing now. Uh, the icon is basically, and someone asked the question because I saw it there, how the Code Diagnostics uh, would uh, match up with uh, the gene expert that has been able to bring, uh, you know, to outpatient uh, detection. And I know that the icon would be a game changer in this whole play because the icon will be coming at again thousands of fraction of the cost of the gene expert and would follow a similar technology uh, like the uh, the gene expert basically uh, getting your sample in and then throwing it in a small I want to say a machine that would be the size of your cell phone and be able to get results almost uh, 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 immediately. So that is in the making, I know it's coming. And then just to see if you can use that for household, yes, because the cost would be so reduced, you can basically, I mean, for someone like me with a large family, I would basically get it for my family and you know, be able to get that testing done at home. Yes, so that's possible. We are looking at that and that would be a way that we really get to engage the community because then it can be used by community outreach personnel. It can be reached with just very minimal training and they can handle that because uh, it would be so easy to use, so user-friendly and so cheap. And really it's been designed for, I saw one other comment about, I am very far off from the city, yes that would be designed for you specifically, who is far off from the city. So Madi. perhaps I can just make a quick comment, um, just in general, um, in line with what Dr. Ritongo was just saying, um, you know, beyond call diagnostics that are now, I would say COVID-19 has accelerated uh, innovation on this front. There is a, a great understanding now that to improve healthcare, we need to really decentralize it and get to that last mile beyond healthcare facilities and into the hands of the of the people, households, workplace, schools. I think, as we were saying, COVID nineteen is a good use case for that. Um, from a product availability perspective, it's also increased tremendously over the last twelve months. You know, for the first time, we see that in the U.S., the FDA has authorized tests for home tests used both antigen-based, so lateral flow tests, rapid tests, but even molecular tests, molecular tests that are now uh, fully disposable and there is no need for an instrument. Now, the cost of most of those tests is still prohibited. Um, and I think the availability in many countries is still gonna lag behind. Um, but we have a couple of efforts ongoing. One of them is on self-tests for COVID, where we are uh, gonna be setting up agreements with manufacturers. Many manufacturers of antigen rapid tests are now pursuing uh, claims for self-testing. So tests are gonna be available very soon. 
uh, for antigen rapid tests, which will be able to meet a more affordable pricing. On the molecular front, some of them are available in the market, but at a higher price. I should say that there is today um, no policy for self-testing. WHO is not endorsing self-testing at this point. That may change um, over the next few weeks or months. Uh, we don't know for sure. But uh, from FINE, UNITAID, and, and other stakeholders, we're conducting studies to evaluate performance of those tests in the hands of uh, lay users and in the household, as well as operational studies to, to generate evidence to see if the policy can be uh, changed. Thank you. Well, we've gone out of time a little bit, so we'll just end with one last question um, that I think we missed from earlier on, and then we'll take a break. So. Um, just a question here about current availability of approved rapid tests for um, SARS-CoV and LMICs, but whether these tests have been piloted in these settings as well, whether there have been any pilots done. So I don't know if anyone knows about that. This is important. It didn't follow correctly. Was that for the COVID antigen? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Whether, whether the, you know, there's been studies already done in LMI. Yes, absolutely. I mean, these tests are being used. Um, I think as of today, and you know, the numbers change by the week, but I think there has been about 60 million tests procured by low and middle income countries. They are well utilized in many countries by now. Um, this is for the Abbott Pump Bio, the uh, standard diagnostics uh, SD biosensor um, test that have been EUL. Those have been procured since October, November, and they are induced in many countries in the Sub-Saharan African region, in the uh, Southeast Asian region, Central and South America. So yes, they are available for procurement and they are induced. There are also studies looking at increasing their uptake um, so I, th you know, I think that the update is really ramping up. Great, thanks very much. This big thank you to all our speakers in this session. So we'll take a break now because we're a bit over time. If we come back at 10 to four UK time, that would be fantastic. So we'll take a 20 minute, well, 15, 17 minute break now. And um, we'll see you in a little bit for our, uh, for our last session. So please come back and join us then. Thank you everybody. Thank you, everybody. Hi, everyone. Welcome back from the break. Um, I'm really uh, interested to introduce uh, this uh, second session of the day. So this will be focused around setting up a mobile laboratory, advantages and challenges. Um, and I'm very pleased to uh, introduce Jacqueline Agbuka, who is the Chief Scientific Officer uh, at the Institute of Lassa Fever Research and Control. Um, she's based at Irua Specialist Teaching Hospital in Nigeria. And she's got a broad experience in training, quality control and laboratory diagnostics and has been involved in the deployment of the mobile lab in Sierra Leone to provide uh, molecular laboratory diagnostics of Ebola. So welcome Jacqueline, we're very pleased to have you here today and we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank so again, you. if people have questions, uh, please post in the Q&A. Thank you. Good day, everyone. I am Abu Kojaki of Iwa Specialist Teaching Hospital, Iwa, Edo State, Nigeria. I will be talking on setting up a mobile laboratory, the challenges and advantages. Here's my outline. The circulation of goods and people is constantly increasing. The risk posed by global threats in the biological field is also growing. And to fulfill their public health and security missions, states must not only exert a continuous monitoring of their populations, but also step up a capacity to identify health risks emerging both internationally and nationally that can affect their population. First, there is an urgent need to implement strategies to strengthen national and regional capacities and, of course, systems to identify, verify, notify, respond rapidly, and national and international concerns. 
And this brings us to the question, what next? What do we do? Where do we start from? I mean, where do we go from here with the information? It is, or do I say the equation is simple? Listen, think, and it will amount to creativity. And this brings us to what a mobile lab is. A mobile laboratory is designed and manufactured to provide on-site medical laboratory services, including providing rapid laboratory services to hospitals, clinics, and everywhere else where infrastructure is, including during emergency situations and natural disaster. Mobile laboratories have been in use for decades for the surveillance and detection of infectious diseases as part of regular research activities and for outbreak response. The contents of a mobile lab have evolved in time. For instance, from a simple sample collection kit and light microscope used during an outbreak in Northern Australia in 1997, to fully self-reliant and equipped vehicles, containing the latent in molecular diagnostic and biocontainment equipment used during the West Africa Ebola virus outbreak in 2014 through 2016. This is an example of a mobile lab situated in a vehicle. In this vehicle, you have a battery of the vehicle powering or supplying electricity to the lab. Everything required or needed are in the vehicle. The equipment and consumables are in stock in the vehicle. And the vehicle can be moved from one location to another, which is why it's called a mobile lab vehicle. A mobile lab is a strategy to swiftly respond to disease outbreaks such as Ebola virus disease, Lassa fever, yellow fever, dengue fever, COVID-19, and other infectious diseases. The contents of a mobile laboratory will be dependent on the type of work to be conducted and the environment in which it will be conducted. When I say the type of work to be conducted, this, it means the situation on ground, the kind of asset to be carried out. You look at the situation on ground, the disease that is being, that is ravaging the community or the location, the kind of disease to be tested for, then you cannot begin to say, oh, I need this or that content in the mobile lab. Secondly, the environment in which the work will be conducted, how conducive is the environment? for that kind of disease. How safe is the environment? How safe is the community? Will situating the mobile lab in that environment cause more harm than good? These are the things we need to look out for. And they are very vital when determining the contents of a mobile lab. Then we have key features of a mobile unit. The first I will be talking about is robustness. Talking about robustness, I mean every item or equipment must have a backup because you don't need to wait for another equipment to be shipped to the testing site when one breaks down before carrying on with the test or assay. And of course, if a mobile lab is not robust, it will affect the turnaround time and management of patients. The next is transportability. All laboratory instruments are selected for size, weight, and durability. Even other extreme field conditions. The complete laboratory equipment is packed in new organized water and dust proof boxes. As you can see on this picture, 
The boxes are very rugged. No matter the conditions you pass them through, they remain intact. And by the time they get to the final destination, all equipment and consumables will be intact. And this leads us to the key elements of a mobile laboratory unit. The first one is personnel and training. A trained and efficient personnel will prove a valuable asset to provide timely and useful support for infectious disease diagnosis, prevention, and control during outbreaks or the wake of natural disaster. So it is very important that the right choice of personnel be trained. For example, you cannot train or deploy someone that studied mathematics when you'll be needing a microbiologist or someone that read statistics in place of a microbiologist. Then we have biosafety and biosecurity. There should be a containment of it to prevent the unintentional release of the organism being tested for. The use of PPE comes in, IPC practices, and so on. Biosecurity management. This has to do with policy, policies. There has to be policies to check unauthorized access to the mobile laboratory because you will not want a situation whereby samples and chemicals will be taken out of the lab to be used as biological weapons. The next one is methods and equipment. The total output of the laboratory during a given period of time depends on the type and number of different procedures to be undertaken and the type of equipment to be used. And of course, I have to let you know that turnaround time can be greatly affected if the appropriate method and equipment are not in place. I give an instance. When we say methods, talking of methods, like you have you have to have to extract RNA for or DNA, talking of molecular diagnosis now or viruses, you want to extract. We have this uh, one that you can use the atomaceous eggs with Kiagin reagents. And also, there's one you also use the complete Kiagin kit using spin corners. But the atomaceous egg, it takes a longer time. It passes through heat and other stages you have to shake. But for the spin corner, it's a straight jacket thing. You just go in, extract your samples in another 40 to 45 minutes, you are out. You are done extracting your RNA depending on the number of samples you have to work on. Talking about equipment also, there are various types of equipment. Is it going to be an automated machine for the extraction or you are going to be extracting manually? All this determine your tongue around time. Then it leads us to logistic support. Logistical support is much list of needs, including infrastructural requirements. Is it going to be a tent? Is there an already existing building? Or will it be the mobile lab vehicle, which I already showed you? What about security for staff? What about staff accommodation? What about communication equipment and methods like your laptops, mobile phones, and of course, internet services? Day to day support for staff, even cold chain management, and then waste disposal. What are their waste policies, waste disposal policies in the country or community? How do they dispose their waste? We need to know all of that while determining the key elements 
And from there, we move on to advantages of a mobile laboratory. After having talked about the contents, the key elements, and the key features, it's also good to know about the advantages of a mobile lab. It increases access to diagnostics by minimizing the distance between sample collection and sample testing site. I think, for instance, I want to, I, I, I'm sending a sample to a lab that is just a kilometer from the sample collection area or site, or, and then I'm sending my sample to a lab that is 50 kilometers away from where the sample was collected. There's a very huge distance, difference between the distance. It provides point information on patients like patients' disease status. And it allows uninfected patients to be released from isolation and safely integrated back into the community. I mean, it doesn't allow unnecessary delay of uninfected patients or suspected patients that are to be negative to stay unduly at the isolation center provides critical information to families of the disease such that timely barriers can be conducted where possible without fear of spreading the disease. Now, especially in Africa, when someone dies, because here in Africa, a lot of us believe so much in witchcraft. And then when someone dies of a particular disease, especially during an outbreak, the relatives or the family members we want to blame it on witchcraft. And some of them go as far as wanting to open up the patient, like dissecting the abdomen to find out what actually keeps their, their ability. But for us, the health workers, we already know that such a person died of the disease, of a particular disease. But a lot of us, because of the tradition in Africa, many persons will not want to believe that something or it was medical that their, their relative died of that disease. Also, on advantages, if a patient is infected, staff can quickly begin tracing his or her contacts to reduce transmission in the community. Mobile lab also offers the ability for differential diagnosis, thus improving clinical management support in real time. When you say differential diagnosis, it could be chemistry, it could be hematology, it could even be testing for other diseases or other viruses to check for any other for other underlying ailment apart from the disease in question. And then it leads also challenges of a mobile laboratory. We have talked about advantages. Of course, anything that has advantages also comes with disadvantages or we say challenges. So here are some challenges of a mobile laboratory. Mobile laboratories provide diagnostic capabilities for routine surveillance. And patient identification during an outbreak. In either situation, they face many challenges. There's quality assurance and quality control. There's identification of the appropriate asset and equipment. It required the infrastructure needed to operate. Post outbreak support. Talking about identification of the appropriate asset and equipment, I already talked about them. All right, I, I do not need to re-emphasize them. The kind of asset. Uh, how, 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 how conducive will it be? Will it be timely? What kind of equipment do we deploy? It requires infrastructure needed to operate. I already talked about that. And the quality assurance and quality control, they are key. They are key and must be adhered to. There must be policy on quality assurance and quality control. 
quality assurance to look at the methodology or the diligence and every other thing that will be used, how suitable is it? And then also to look at the, the, the documents that will be used to work everything under quality assurance. And then for quality control, the process that controls the process of the work from bench to bench, what should be done at every step. These are very, very key. And of course, it is advisable to have a laboratory consultant in the mobile lab that looks into all of that. Post outbreak support. When there is an outbreak, there are NGOs, different bodies, institutions from different countries. They want to make a name, they want to be mentioned as those that, as those that were part of fighting the, the outbreak. But as soon as the outbreak is over, they all go back to their various countries and it becomes a problem. Training staff, no reagents to work with, and so on. So many challenges during post outbreak. And then it goes out to logistical arrangements, which I already talked about, providing for the health and safety of the laboratory staff, and of course, concerns about biosafety. Already talked about biosafety. It's really difficult to manage while on the field. It's a very big challenge. And then mobile laboratories are expensive and require significant resources to run effectively. This is where robustness comes in. That was when I talked about robustness before. So all these challenges needs to be looked into or be prepared. We should be prepared for them or be ready to resolve them when, when we encounter them on the field. And it brings me also to, it brings me to recommendations. I would recommend the indigenization of collaborative efforts. I would also recommend that establishment of functional regional labs be encouraged and strengthened. And of course, training and retraining of staff. Why did I say training and retraining of staff? Even after outbreak, we need to train more persons to prepare, to prepare them for the future, even for the day-to-day -day running of a lab. And as diseases keep, new diseases keep emerging and re-emerging, new protocols, new procedures, new reagents also evolve with them. So it is, it is wise that staff or members of staff are retrained over and over again so that they get used to whatever it is that is in the market, whatever it is that is trending with rigorous diagnostics in the mobile lab or the practices in the mobile lab. And this draws us to the conclusion. The continuous development of mobile laboratories for public health as well as basic applied and clinical research during outbreaks is inevitable. And we certainly prove to be invaluable going forward. And I make bold to say that physical, mental, emotion, family and social health will result to well-being. This is a group photograph of organizers, participants, and facilitators during the West African sub-regional workshop on mobile laboratory operations, which was organized and sponsored by Pandora IGNet Nigeria. From this picture, you can see a blue arrow pointing at Professor Eddie Asogo, who is the PI to Pandora IGNet in Nigeria. More photographs. On my left is a group photograph of some of the participants standing by the poster. And then at the middle are facilitators with Professor Stefan Gunther 
of Bernard Lodge Institute of Tropical Medicine. It's a very great pillar behind the mobile lab in Nigeria. On the third photo, it's a group photo of participants and facilitators. Some of the participants also, because they were in different groups. Here are photos of setting up and working in the mobile lab. You can see the organized boxes I talked about when they arrived at the building. This is an already existing building that was given to them. So you can see they are discussing and trying to unpack their boxes. On the second photo, they are trying to fix the glove box. I talked about the bio-containment. When I was talking about biosafety, that's a glove box. Person, the, the person to, when you want to work with the glove box, just the hands will be inside the gloves, to work inside the glove box. And then on the third photo, you can see that they have they, they, they have started demarcation. They are demarcating with a foil. On my, the, the, the photographs below are some work areas, work benches, documentation where someone is trying to document samples that were received. And then there's another bench, the, re, the reagents preparation. And then there's someone on the amplification bench, bench trying to look at the rooms or look through the rooms. And then more photos of work in the lab. Group photographs of participants and facilitators. And then on the second picture on, at the top, the Like I said, these are picture. That's an arrow pointing at me there, teaching the or training the participants on how to validate and interpret results. More group photographs. More photographs with participants and facilitators. And of course, this I, I would like to let you know that these participants were drawn from countries in the sub-region, within the sub-region for the mobile lab train in Nigeria. It was a great experience for them. Thanks for listening. Thanks so much, Jacqueline, for that uh, really interesting overview of the mobile lab uh, that you are involved with in Nigeria. We've got some questions coming in, so if people want to start posting their questions, that would be great. Um, let's take the ones we've got so far. Um, so from Tawelda, is mobile lab, uh, a mobile lab alone enough for the management of patients with infectious diseases? And what are the basic health professionals included in the mobile lab? Jacqueline, are you able to take that question? Oh, yeah. Two questions. Hello. Hi, Jacqueline. Thank you. Yeah. So for the first question, well, um, the mobile lab is a part of management team for infection. And it's usually not deployed alone. It is deployed along with a team of epidemiologists, disease surveillance officers, clinicians, which include infectious disease specialists. Um, in summary, a mobile lab is deployed to complement an existing team. Thank you. Thanks. And we've got a question here from Godfrey. What's the cheaper option, setting up a temporary lab or having a mobile lab? I think that's a good question. Any ideas on that, Jacqueline? Okay. Well, well, well. The integrity of your results and safety of personnel in outbreak situations should not be compromised. In setting up temporary labs, what do you hope to achieve? How will you guarantee quality? 
we cannot afford to gamble or do not want to gamble. That's, that's the way I see it. Yeah, that's the way it is. Thank you. Thanks. Um, and uh, from Verena, how can mobile laboratories be made more affordable, respectively? Uh, which other more affordable solutions are available can be developed? Any thoughts on that, Hello. Jacqueline? Hello, Asobel. Hi, Danny. How are you? Yeah, good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> good to see you. Are, you. are you able to take this question? I didn't know you were on the call. That's great that you're with us too. Yeah. So what's the last question you asked now? I hope I can support Jacqueline. Yeah, so how, how can mobile labs be made more affordable um, and what other affordable solutions are available can be developed? Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid it's, um, it's really very difficult to, they're pretty expensive. And um, um, what is usually how I have is that uh, mobile lab, the, the composite units, are already predetermined and then um, before by the manufacturer, so you can't compromise that. What might make it maybe more affordable is the the deployment. The deployment. Um, sometimes you may have to use an air cargo plane to carry your units to the site. Sometimes you have to use a lorry. All these logistics come in. But if we are able to get more of a cheaper option of transporting them, that, that could be good for the personnel also. And instead of maybe transporting everybody from, say, Nigeria to Syria alone, we could also decide to use some of the local in that country to reduce the cost of uh, transportation and logistics running the mobile laboratory. Otherwise, the cost of reagents, the cost of uh, replacing the equipment uh, are very, really, very expensive in the mobile lab, yeah. So uh, that seems like good suggestions. And I guess that, you know, it is expensive and, you know, some part of it, you know, you can't reduce the cost, but uh, you can improve the logistics. So, um, I have a question actually, because uh, we're a bit slow on the questions at the moment. So hopefully more, oh, Palmer, you have your hand up. Do you want to ask a question? Sure, sure. I have a question for the presenter. I'm just wondering, I, I know that I talked to a lady in Geneva Foundation and they basically help, you know, uh, they've helped a few countries to get mobile apps. And I was wondering if uh, she has those contacts and how to get them to respond because I know that I tried and I failed in that direction. Yeah, Pama, how are you? I am Danny great, here. Danny. <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> Pleasure is so, mine, Danny. Yeah, actually the goal of the mobile, like that, the one we have here, we have two units, is to support and collaborate with um, uh, countries around the sub-region during disease outbreak. So we are very much willing to collaborate, to support outbreak responses in the sub-region. Like as she said, during the Ebola outbreak, we had to support Syria alone. And uh, even within Nigeria, we have had also to support other parts of the country during the last Africa outbreak, during the Ebola outbreak. I think collaboration is the name of the game in the mobile lab. So we are, we are ready, we are open. Uh, if we can reach me, then we can always discuss on how best to do this. Over, Dana. Thanks for that question and answer. Um, 
So I have a quick question. So you brushed over it, Jacqueline, about waste, but I thought it was a really good point um, and something that never occurred to me because obviously you generate quite a lot of waste in the lab. And if you don't have access to an autoclave, that soon becomes a big problem. So I'm just wondering about the strategies for dealing with that, particularly if you're going in, say, to a very remote region. Jacqueline, I don't know if you want to take that, or Danny. Talking about um, waste, how to manage waste in the lab. Like I said uh, in my presentation, I talked about waste management. You have to consider the waste management policies in, in the area of deployment, and then you follow suit. But um, like while we were still alone, we did, uh, we went into burning, incineration. That's you alone. That was what we did. So you basically need some kind of other stationary laboratory near, near enough by that you can transport the waste back to and discard it in one way or another. Okay, so we're getting some more questions in the chat. Uh, Godfrey's asking, to run a mobile lab, we need a driver, lorry, technicians, etc. What risk assessment measures should one consider before thinking of a mobile lab? Any thoughts on that, Jacqueline or Danny? It's breaking. Do you want me to repeat the question? Yeah. Uh, so uh, Godfrey's asked, to run a mobile lab, we need a driver, a lorry, technicians, etc. What risk assessment measures should one consider before thinking of a mobile lab? Yeah, let me do it again. Yeah, before we embark on the, uh, deploying a mobile lab with the required personnel and drivers and all the people, it is important to know the status, health status of these persons. For example, you want to know if they have been immunized against certain diseases before people are deployed. Uh, if there are um, vaccine preventable diseases common in the area they are going to. It would be good that persons are immunized. Like yellow fever, maybe meningitis, and other common diseases to reduce the risk of contacting other infectious diseases. Of course, now COVID 19 is here. We need to ensure that the person have taken the vaccine before they, they travel. So, persons who have a um, health situation that uh, could be a problem. Uh, it's not good that they are on the trip for mobile app deployment. Over. Thank you, Danny. Um, so I have a general question, actually, which maybe uh, is more of a comment and uh, perhaps to everybody, all our speakers today. So really it's coming through that we're going to increase, try to increase, say, home test kits. Uh, increased diagnosis through mobile labs, et cetera. But I'm just wondering, you know, if you increased these things, how do you deal with if you don't have the uh, medical support to then treat those diseases that you've identified and how people feel about that? It's just kind of more of an open discussion if anyone has any comments uh, on that. Palmer, you've got your hand on, that's great. Yes. I put my hand up because uh, I think that this is where we, we should not ignore uh, uh, certain things. And one of the things that I say we shouldn't ignore is uh, the potential that uh, we have from the African pharmacopoeia, because I'm just talking now as an African here. And I think uh, the, uh, 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 the African Union is going to be running a webinar soon on that. And this is an opportunity that I'm using to really encourage people to attend that as well. But just to say that there is quite some potential that some people that you would even expect do have, I'm not saying that they should not rely on medicine, you know, conventional medicine. If you can't get it, go for it. But then I think the whole, the notion here is 
people should not think that they do not have a plethora of uh, options. There are, are really options that exist out there and people should make the use of them. I'll take two cases that have uh, 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 really worked well in Cameroon. So this is a Catholic bishop that uh, the Archbishop of Douala, for instance, put out uh, some, you know, uh, I don't want to say <laughs> some formula together that has really been able to, you know, tilt the curve, the curve for COVID-19 cases. And so people have benefited from it. And I haven't personally, but people have benefited from it and still continue to benefit from it. And these are really, if you look at the way the Catholics are structured, their health systems, the way they structure it, it's really targeting people who cannot really afford, you know, being uh, treated as, you know, first class, you know, when it comes to uh, 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 options for medications. And then the second other case that I want to uh, also just flag, I think it's one case that I just heard of. I've not really delved into it very much in Nigeria, where you know people are getting you know really good uh, care from the African pharmacopoeia. And I know that uh, that particular one, they had started that group had started working uh, far back in the days of HIV for immune boosters. And for that one, I know I benefited. I mean, I had at one time like three members of my family that were all suffering from uh, you know, HIV AIDS, and then I had to use that. So there is that group. I don't remember the name very well, but I know they are also now uh, into uh, uh, immune boosters for COVID-19. So there is hope for Africa. That's what I'm saying. And of course, with all the donations and all that, uh, you know, all these international organizations have been doing, I think we have quite some support in the uh, conventional medical facilities. Thanks. Thank you, Palmer. Someone's just asking, uh, Verena's asking which uh, formula you're referring to from the Archbishop. Uh, would you like Monsignor to- Cleda? Cleda, I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. I know that people line up every day, get pictures of people. Right now, I've just been told in the, uh, the they call it the what center in Douala, they are like what, almost 200 people lined up waiting in line to get that right now. I mean, like when I was delivering my, my presentation this morning because I asked for that information. And so I don't know, Monseigneur Cleda, Cleda, how do you spell that? Okay, Cleda <laughs> is, uh, is the Archbishop of Douala. That's the best, thing. <laughs> you know. Cleda. Maybe this would be maybe this would be a good place to deploy your mobile lab to. This right. Cue, this cue. Exactly. I mean, that would be nice, you know, to just get them all tested and then see how they respond. Yes, but that uh, really, honestly, it's a game changer in a country that is able to promote this. That would really change the stakes for people who've had it. I mean, in my group, we have an alert group that is running uh, the Africa uh, CCP for the clinical characterization of COVID cases. So these are our team people who go out to meet these patients. In fact, two weeks ago, all of my team was down from COVID, all of them, like 90%. And everybody was on that medication. And this week we are back to activity. So that's just to see what is happening. And honestly, I can make these claims now, but you know, it's uh, worth trying. Hello, Pama. Yes. That, that's very interesting. Um, has this, how long has this since been? Is there any, any, any preliminary publication of this? Because what you are saying now sounds too good to be true. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. know, right? Yeah. 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 So, you're right, Denny. And honestly, if you didn't ask this question, I would have been surprised. Yeah. You see, the way countries support uh, individual efforts, it's a little problematic, uh, depending on the country that you are. And I say problematic for the case of my country, Cameroon. So before Monseigneur Cleda, we had Professor Anomangu, who had mm -hmm. come out with this lofty uh, technology of you know, getting out blood samples for HIV patients, getting the virus exposed and then uh, you know redoing a transfusion to basically take care of the virus but that went nowhere 
Professor Nomangu is dead and gone, and that's a technology that is forgotten. We have Monsignor Clayton now. I will not be surprised again if nothing comes up from my country in terms of support. The kind of support that we saw in Madagascar, I don't know, I'm not from Madagascar, but I saw the president coming out and supporting that. So it is too good to be true, you are right. As scientists, I know it's only now that there is a group in the University of Yaoundé one led by Professor Mundipa Paul, who was asking to get these samples to test them and test all these other things around, you know, toxicity and all of that to make sure that this formula is really just uh, having more of the benefit than, you know, some of the uh, risk that could be out there. So hopefully mm -hmm. something will come out of that group. We'll in do some randomized control trials and that will just right. I don't yeah. have the details yeah. of what he's doing. I saw yeah. his initial contact that he was establishing with yeah. Monsignor Cleda to get some of the formula in, uh, in his laboratory in the University of Yaoundé One uh, toxicity lab, toxicology lab for testing. So mm. hopefully something will come out soon. Yeah, That's the that. only one I know. I don't know if there is anything else that is happening. Uh, right yeah, now. We, could, uh, we could involve the African CDC. In this, yeah, it's an interesting oh, yeah, one. sure. Yeah. I would be... Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would be happy to stand and make uh, that mm -hmm. kind of uh, uh, thing ongoing for this particular formula. Yes, the Archbishop of Doha has a formula that people rely on greatly in Cameroon as we speak. Okay, thank you, Palmer. Important uh, to follow up with the scientific backing and uh, a trial, I think, is what uh, Danny's suggesting there. Um, so we've just got a comment from Godfrey saying that home-based testing and care is the way to go and may need to think of how best to improve on this approach. It certainly sounds like it has its benefits um, to be able to test at home, uh, but also creates some problems too. Um, I don't think we have any other questions in the chat unless I've missed anything. So if, um, if I've missed anything, if uh, anyone wants to let me know. Otherwise, um, I think if there's no other questions um, for any of the speakers from today, then we'll probably close a bit early. And um, I'd just like to uh, really do the thank yous now. Um, so I first want to say a big thank you to Leah Arudu from um, University College London who works with us, who has been absolutely instrumental in putting the workshop together. And she's been a big part of the organization, inviting the speakers and putting the program together and it wouldn't have happened without Leah. So thank you, Leah, for all your input. We also want to thank uh, Bonnie, Nicole and Emma from the Global Health Network who have supported us in putting together the workshop, um, all the formatting, all the structure and all the technical help. And the I'd like to say a big thank you to our presenters today because obviously the workshop won't happen without you giving your time um, and commitment. So a thanks to Francine, um, to Marta and Davey from Find, um, to Alisi from uh, Fame Up, from, uh, to Palmer from um, Alert, and to Madison from Co Diagnostics. Uh, incorporated um, and to Jacqueline from ISTH and also thanks to Tim and Danny who chipped in as well as we've gone along with um, answering questions. So thank you to all the attendees today for joining us and we, we have the other half of the workshop tomorrow so we hope that you'll all be able to join us for that as well. Um, so I'll just uh, say thank you very much everybody um, and have a good evening. Or well, if it's morning, have a good rest of the day. <laughs> Thanks, Isabel. Thank you so much. Thank you, Isabel. Thank Isabel, you. good job. <laughs> Thanks, Isabel. Bye. Thank you, Isabel. Bye. 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 Bye.